I'm going to be talking to them and seeing they usually do a pretty good job with the swag, but we really appreciate that. So we could not do this without of our partners. And uh, we've got a good day. I'll get right at it. We're going to, our first guest, um, did everybody enjoy the breakfast? Good breakfast? Well, you you can thank our next speaker. She's going to come up here, uh, Brittany uh, Brees with uh, Rancher Government Solutions. She was our breakfast sponsor. So she's going to kind of open us up and... Brittany, you here? There you go. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Who's excited to be up this early on a Monday morning? <laughs> so on behalf of Rancher Government, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this morning. Um, we're excited to be here. We are first timers at this conference, or at least my colleague and I are, because we're the newbies. Um, we're excited to hear from all the speakers across industry and government talking about AI, data security, and cyber. And we look forward to partnering with you and modernizing agency missions. So everyone have a great day. And our official welcome welcome today is Tim Hartman. He's CEO of GovExec. I he is a proud JMU Duke. In the in the pool, he picked them to win the NCAAs. I don't know if that worked out that great, but at least they got through the first round. And he and I share, we love the Pittsburgh Steelers. So we're both uh from that part. Of, oh, we got some Ravens fans. Yeah, we'll be talking tonight. Um no, but uh I want to welcome uh Tim Hartman, CEO of GovExec. Good morning. I'm honored to provide the third welcome this morning to you all. Um, no, thank you all for joining us. It's it's a, a pleasure to be here. I'm here to talk a little bit about Guy Tech and the, the history of it and the importance of the conference. Um, it's really an honor for me to stand here. Guy Tech has been uh, really one of the foundations of the government technology um, and government improvement movements for decades, which even for me, it was surprising. When I joined this market probably 15 years ago, uh, Guy Tech was one of the first conferences that I attended. Um, back then, it was in Orlando, I think. Uh, is that right? In Orlando. Um, and you know, as you think about the the journey of Guy Tech over time, it was actually founded six decades ago. It was in 1966. The White House issued a memorandum that was all about helping connect industry and government around uh, the the solutions and collaboration that was needed to move forward. And I was thinking about what it was like in 1966 to feel like technology was changing so rapidly and needed to be implemented on a really aggressive timetable. And here we are six decades, six decades later, and we're all struggling with the same thing where you've got artificial intelligence and cyber innovation all coming to the fore. And we have to figure out how to apply it for government so that government improves its mission and serves the serves the country. Um, and it's it's a huge challenge. Uh, Tom Suter assures me that he was not here at the first one in 1966, but I think it's a it's an open question. Um, just a few years ago, Guy Tech joined forces with ATARC, which is um, the Advanced Technology and Academic Research Center, and it's been a, a tremendous partnership. We at GovExec watched it um, very carefully and watched how Tom and Bill and Tim just sort of fostered the relationship and fostered this event. Um, you know, and I think that the the goal was to unify our approach as a as an industry as we try to face the dynamic challenges and emerging trends that are present at this moment. And so uh, about a year ago, GovExec acquired ATARC and partnered with, with Tom and team. And our goal was to uh, help them with their commitment to helping the industry and government solve problems. And it's a really great model. I think this conference does a really great job of bringing everybody together, but the working groups that ATARC does, all of the work they're doing hand in hand between industry and government is really something special in this market that, that we want to support. At GovExec, our goal is to, and our mission is to facilitate collaboration and progress in government. And we do that in lots of different ways. And uh, our belief is that government can be more effective with more action. And so we strive to catalyze governments at all levels to deliver on their promises efficiently and effectively, whether you're in federal, state and local, or DOD. We do that through our publications, which many of you may know. We do that through events and, and membership organizations like ATARC. 
uh, and we also do it through data and intelligence. Um, and so one of the big platforms that we acquired and, and that we're building right now is called GovTribe. If you haven't checked it out, I would look at it. It's got really, really advanced data sets around government and industry opportunities. And it's probably the only tool available right now in the market that uses AI as a way to simplify the government contracting process. And so whether you're in government or whether you're in industry, it can give you dossiers and interesting insights. I use it when I prepare for meetings, like if we're going to meet with a company, it tells me all about what that company has done in government. Um, and in ways that it's like having someone that's worked there a long time tell you exactly what they do. So yes, they do IT transformation, but they also supply mannequins to the, uh, you know, uh, combat uh, troops in, in Oregon's National Guard. You know, you'll find interesting uh, tidbits like that. So um, I encourage you all to check it out here. Um, our goal is to enable leaders, whether in government or industry, to do their jobs better. And we've got lots of different ways that we do that. So Guy Tech is an important piece of that. I'm proud to see everybody here. I'm thankful for your attendance. And I want to um, just pitch next year's Guy Tech where we really want to build on this. We really want to bring more people to it. So please spread the word that GuyTech is, is uh, you know, a destination that people should have on their calendars. Um, so enjoy the experience here. I think there's a lot of incredible opportunities for learning, networking, um, whether you're a seasoned government IT leader or an industry innovator, there's definitely something here for everyone. So let's make the most of our time together. Thank you for letting me be a part of this incredible community and have a great rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. Uh, we've got one more speaker who's going to come up, Don Hewitt, uh, who's uh, Director of Marketing Demand Solutions at Oracle. You want to come on up, Don? It's great to meet you. Hopefully you got a good breakfast. You're all set. Come on up. So good morning. Uh, Don Hewitt from Oracle. Oracle's very, very proud to be a sponsor of this particular event. Uh, we have been working for years and years since our inception to both help manage and protect uh, your data. And this has been specific. In fact, our start started with the federal uh, customer. And if you did not know, we've carried that legacy on into a foundational cloud offering that is both directed to serve the mission critical enterprise workload, both in a performant and economic and also a mission critical way to secure that transaction and modernize your workloads as you move forward. So again, thank you very much. We uh, are proud to be a sponsor of this event and please enjoy. All right, I'm gonna hand the keys to this program over to a good friend of mine, uh, Jason Miller, executive editor of Fed News Network. And he will be our master of ceremonies today. And he, we're gonna learn some, you're gonna do trivia. You got it all lined up. I don't wanna even steal your thunder. But come on up, Jason, you're in charge. Never give someone uh, in radio a microphone. So I will take the microphone. It's my microphone, just to start there. Anyways, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thank you to Tom, all the folks at ATARC, Kim, Maddie. They worked really hard to put this together and I appreciate being invited and appreciate being a part of it as always. Uh, so, so thank you to all of them. As you heard, I'm Jason Miller, Executive Editor of Federal News Network. Shameless plug is you can find us on federalnewsnetwork.com and, of course, on 1500 AM. All of you, as you drive home today or tomorrow, please hit that AM radio button. I promise you, one, 1500 will be a preset because it comes with your car. And second, uh, it actually works. So just as a reminder. All right. So uh, today is about you, right? Today is about you participating and asking great questions and learning something and making sure you walk away, not going, oh, I've heard that before from that person again. So to do that means you need to participate. I encourage uh, everyone to raise your hand, to ask questions, uh, create the conversation. If it's a one way, it's always less valuable than when it's two way. Um, I will be moderating a couple panels and you'll see me uh, do my best Phil Donahue impression. So if you remember Phil Donahue, you know what that means. If you don't, then you're, young <laughs> uh but anyway so so please uh, uh take back so uh while um alexis you get ready you get your game face on i have, I have some trivia or some some things to consider before she gets up here and blows our mind so here's the first one 
um, we're talking about emerging technologies. Uh, Tom, for some reason, you decide everything has to be around AI, which we all kind of had to go, okay, Tom. Um, but uh, I went back and did some research and said, okay, well, if we're talking about emerging technologies, we're talking about today and we're in the future. So what's today? And then what's, what, what, what happened in 2012? I picked roughly 12 years ago as the starting point. And in 2012, I went back and said, uh, what technologies were kind of emerging back in 2012? And this is the World Economic Forum said the top emerging technologies back then were wireless power, personalized nutrition, medicine and disease prevention, informatics to add value to existing information. So I thought, okay, that's interesting. 12 years ago, we're getting some of that today, right? Wireless power, you can take your phone and you have that. Put it, I saw some car ad or something. You can just put your phone down and it, it, it charges wirelessly, right? Uh, you talk about personalized nutrition, medicine, disease prevention. Um, there was a memo just came from OMB on Friday about basically declaring COVID-19 is officially over because the federal safer task force, federal task force has been disbanded. Um, and But a lot of what came from COVID was personalized medicine in, in many ways, the, the vaccines, uh, and then all the pieces and parts of the Apple watches we wear that moderates your, your heart rate. So So there's that. And then uh, the last informatics, right? Everything's about data now. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. So let's go fast forward six years later, 2018, right? So here we are, 2018. And this is from Bernard Marr, who's a world-renowned futurist. He made these predictions just six years ago. What technologies were in, in the breakthrough? So of the, the 10 technologies we're actually working today are 3D metal printing, cloud-based AI services. So those are the two that really stood out from six years ago. Others were like, online privacy using blockchain, the, the Babel fish earbuds, I had to remember what those were, or uh, provide translation services in real time. So those didn't quite come to fruition. So those were technology six years. So Alexis, on that note, what's happening next? All right, well, we'll come up here and tell us because that's really what's important, not me just babbling without my earbuds. So everyone, please welcome Alexis Benelli from Air Force ARL Research Lab. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Is it okay if I walk around and shake this up? Yeah. Cool. All right. While we get my slides fixed, um, good morning. Nice to see you all. Some of you have heard me speak maybe on this topic before, and so there are going to be some things that are not entirely surprising, but I've also learned some things since the last time we talked, and so hopefully you'll get to see a little bit of that. Um, as soon as this comes up, I'll go through a very fun and bright and brilliant slideshow that I made entirely with AI, so you can at least enjoy what you can do with AI right now. But I wanted to kind of pose a couple of interesting things to you. What do you think? Here we go. I'm going to give you a second. Okay. Let me see. That worked. All right. So I want you to think about complexity. So what does it look like and how are we benefited or not benefited as we keep things complex? So right now, I'm okay to flip down? Cool. Um, so what I want to talk a little bit of is wh where we're entering this exponential age, but I want you to think about complexity for a minute. So how many people drove here? Okay, most of us. And um, how many people, you know, worry about a car accident here or there or something happening that you don't know about? Yeah, okay, some of us. Um, and we all had to go to driving school, right? We all had to get our license. We all had to do lots of things. I want you to imagine for a moment if getting, if the dependency on, on having safe and good driving was as complicated as the RMF process. If, if each of us had to apply a thousand plus controls, right? Ironically, our, our perception, if, if driving was that complicated, would it feel more or less safe? probably less, right? Because it would depend on me doing all of those controls correctly, right? And things like that. So part of what I wanna kick us off with is this idea that this might be a time in AI when we want to start to think about simplicity and we wanna simplify our conversation versus consistently making it more and more complex. And I'll tell you why I think that matters. So we're gonna skip me. So the first thing is what we're really doing when we navigate a new technology is we're going on a journey. And so what I did is I, in essence, asked uh, and, and kind of found as I was helping people navigate technology that there are four relationships. So the first is ta-da, right? Like, oh my gosh, 
like, I can't believe it does that. Like how many people use a chat GBT or Bard? And like the first time you were like, whoa, yeah? Okay, the rest of you didn't put your hands up. I know you haven't used it yet, but it's pretty clear. Uh, the second one, uh-oh, right? And the uh-oh, keep in mind, this is about our journey as people, right? The uh-oh comes when what we're really doing is saying, what does this mean for me, right? It could be professionally, personally, et cetera, but it's that slow down moment, which is, and all of these are good and, and, and useful moments, but it's that slow down moment where you kind of say, uh oh, now how many people feel like this is the moment we're in right now? No one feels like we're in the uh oh moment. Bias, trust, you know, ethics, we don't feel like we're in the uh oh moment. Okay. Now, the next thing that happens, and this happened, I went through this personally. The next thing that happens is when you go from ta da to uh oh, then all of a sudden, and you start to understand how this technology might be relevant to you. You go to your personal like, uh-huh, this is how I'm gonna use it, right? And then finally, that technology becomes really boring, right? In the sense that like, of course you Google it, right? Then it just becomes like blah or meh, like it just becomes normal. But I want you to think about something right now. Who here knows how the Google algorithm works? Is that gonna stop you from Googling it? Right, but it's really interesting. You can't actually know how it works because it changes dynamically every second of every day. Because if these two tables looked something up in short order, the algorithm would change to adapt to that, right? And so I highlight this because a lot of times when we confront a new technology, we forget and we don't credit ourselves with everything that we've confronted, navigated, and gone through in this process before. And I say this because each of us end up having a role around how we help others, how we help ourselves first, right? Put your air mask on in the plane first, but then how we help others come along, right? And whether it's the companies here today, whether it's us as federal leaders or citizens or parents or sisters or any of those types of things, ultimately this is the journey we go on. So why does that matter now? I work in national security and one of the things I have to remind all my colleagues is change is hard. War is harder. Right, so when we have those moments where we think, you know, I don't want to change, this feels really hard, this feels really scary, there are bigger and scarier other things out there that we need to be ready for. And so one of the things I've got to help and contribute to in our mission is in essence, how do I make sure that we're more change ready? And ultimately where I really, really want to ground you. And for me, this was a really game changing kind of approach when I started to think about AI. And that is what AI really does is it is an exponential relationship with knowledge, right? It is a relationship with knowledge at speed and scale in a way that we have never navigated before. I'm gonna show you how we got there though. And the other thing that's really important, and, and again, keep in mind that technology only matters. So let me say it a different way. Technology is bullshit if it's not useful to us and the human moment that we find ourselves, society, et cetera. And the reason why this is really important is because in the last couple of years, something fundamentally shifted that we didn't talk a lot about. And that is that the change horizon. So when we think about government, when we think about DOD, the actual change horizon, meaning how long it takes us to look at something, decide how we feel about it, adapt it for it to become normal, and then for at some point to become legacy, right, that evil, evil legacy word, um, compressed. It, that, that cycle used to be five to 15 years. It is now six months to 1.2 years. I want that to sit in for a minute. Six months, six months is the new change horizon. So what does that mean for you? That means, what's your name? Lisa, look at this. I'm not calling you. Y'all don't know what's coming, okay? So, so Lisa, that means that Lisa has to make five times more decisions than she did in the same period of time. But more importantly, she has to do that in ways that she has never done before. So as an example, you used to be able to go and you would buy a burrito. Now when you want to buy a burrito, you make 48 different decisions about exactly what you want in that burrito. And it's great, right? Because you get the perfect burrito, but you just bled 48 
decisions in that process. So one of the things this change means for us is that we have to become really comfortable in a new era as leaders. And what I mean by that is you cannot expect to have the right answer when things change every six months. What you have to become comfortable with is right for now. How many people in government or think government leaders, defense leaders are super comfortable in the idea of it's right for now? There's a reason we have more than a thousand controls in the RMF process, right? We want it right. We don't get that anymore, right? So this is part of what, again, what, in speaking today, what I really like to try to contribute to is what does it look like to be in this new mindset and this new headspace and this new reality together? And the final one that I would pose for you is that 90%, and this number is already outdated, 90% of the world's information came online in the last three years. So now all of a sudden, I'm navigating change faster than ever. I'm making more decisions than ever. But what's the number one thing as a public servant I'm supposed to do? Make good evidence and information-driven decisions. So now I have between 1,000 and 100,000 times more information in which to inform those decisions. This is a fundamentally different time. So what? This is just an example, right, of the type of data that our minds process every single minute, right? There's a guy with the white t-shirt. There's a whole bunch of people. Do I have to wait for the slide? Oh my gosh, right? Your mind is an incredible, incredible thing. So what does that mean in today? And Jason and I were talking last night over too much, in my case, too many, too much ice cream. And in his case, I won't out him. Too many fries, maybe. Fries, yeah, fries, fries, there's fries. Uh, so the most powerful weapon and the most precious resource on earth today is attention. Attention is the most precious resource. So we talk about constant change. We talk about all this information. We talk about all these decisions. But ultimately, and I'm going to tell you, this is why AI matters now. This is why AI as a relationship with knowledge at speed and scale is hitting us at a moment when we need it. And that is because our biology, our attention, our processing speed does not follow Moore's law, right? The reality is we can only process about 60 bits a minute, which means for those of you who are multitasking right now, you're gonna get a, a, a word I say here and there, right? But your email and whoever you're reporting back to is gonna get a little bit, but no one's gonna get quality, right? Now, if I'm a squirrel, what do I do as a squirrel? Where does my attention go? Nuts and predators, nuts and predators, nuts and predators, right? Because their attention is biologically honed to what matters. So the other thing that I think is really important to understand is if we're in this era of an incredible relationship with information, compute and AI and all these tools are not commodities anymore. And I would really, really encourage us, for those of us who are buying these things, to not think about these tools as commodities. The first and most important reason for that is because technology is where we practice our culture. If you think about it, when I go in every single day, who do I spend the most time with? I spend it with my productivity tool. That's who I have the closest relationship at my entire organization, right? Who is it that um, you know, I use to interact? Who is it, you know, what type of information do I access? The tools and the choices we make about our technology ultimately are decisions about the culture and the behaviors that we want. If we make it hard to share information, we're going to be an organization that doesn't share information. If we make it harder to be, if we make it harder to get information out than we did to get it in, we are going to be an, an organization that does not communicate a lot out. If we are an organization that makes it hard for us to share information acrosswise, we are not going to partner well. And yet we treat these things like commodities instead of behaviors. Well, one of the things I want to draw your attention to in this slide in particular is because from a national security context, what I really am expected to help you know, our leaders do is ask and answer what if faster than the adversary. And this last weekend was the newest chapter in what if, right? All of a sudden, we see things happening around the world at scale with technologies. And the most important thing is this. 
A, so far we've been pretty ready for it, right? We've been able to kind of address the drones. What's next? What if? What if? What if? Do you expect the next, you know, the next assault to be exactly the same? No. So what starts to be critical is how fast and how many options I can actually consider. So if we look at these games, tic-tac-toe has nine moves, right? Nine options, chess, 30, AlphaGo, which was considered one of the most, you know, sophisticated strategy game, 360 moves. So now when all of a sudden I'm thinking about how many moves I can process, Lisa, let me ask you, I'm gonna put you back on the spot. If you were the one who was looking at what's happening, what's transpiring, and you were the general who had to make the call, do you want to be presented with nine well thought out options and a recommendation from that? 30 well thought out options and a recommendation? Or would you like to have actually seen all 360 what could happen and now I get the recommendation? You want nine. Okay, that was not where I was going, but that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, so normally you don't. What if I told you that you could have all, there was, there was the same time tax. So you could have them all in 10 seconds. Which ones would you want? Which one would you like to be considered? Say 360. Okay. <laughs> well, sure, you're gonna, right? And that's where, bi that's where bias and knowledge come in. But the reality is for me, I would have liked to run a number of scenarios right, as many as possible, and then kind of made a decision from there. And this is one of the ideas of AI as an ally, kind of your super processor, right, in speed and scale. And this is the one, this is one of the newer things that I'm introducing. And if I ask you to take anything away from what I'm going to share with you today, I really, really want it to be this. And I'm going to time check really quick. Okay. So I call this kind of the race. So if you imagine the race to knowledge, um, one of the things I was trying to think about was what is it really that we are putting on the table? And I'm going to explain this to you, and then I'm going to give you a really powerful example that I had most recently. So if this is a knowledge race, I want you to imagine, uh, you know, Tom, this is, we're in a race, okay? We're going to race. I'm going to kick your ass just to be very clear about it. We're going to race. Uh, and there's a finish line, and there is a million dollars at stake, real money, right? Tom's writing a check for a million dollars when I run this race. Where, you know, there's the starting line, there's a hundred yards and a million dollars. So uh, if you are, you know, the red runner, which is Tom in this case, by the way, uh, Tom has, you know, he's like, well, you know, the information I'm going to bring to this knowledge race is mine. I know lots of stuff. I've been around. I have lots of experience, right? I have is 15 years, right? Professional experience, something like that. You're very young. Uh, so he's going to start. But I want you to think about that starting block, that's what you bring, right? That's your individual knowledge. Now, the, you could start at about, I'm guessing that we're about 20, 20 yard mark with the red and the yellow, that is you and your other expert colleagues, right? So, okay, when you respond to an RFP or you're on a capture team or you're whatever, you're gonna get a really smart group of people in a room and you're gonna say, okay, how do we go after this? We have a lot of experience, we've been doing this. So you're, you're starting at the 20 yard line. The third is when you're starting at the 20, or the, you're starting about the 30 yard line, maybe 40, wherein you have those experts, but now all of a sudden you have generative AI. And let me tell you why. Because generative AI is now the public table stakes base level of information the base level, meaning Lisa and I have the same access to the same thing, right? Uh, Don and I, right, we like if, let's say Don's my adversary, Don can look and see the exact same stuff and ask the exact same questions if he, if he asks them like I do. So all of a sudden, you know, by combining those two things together, now maybe I'm starting at 40% or 50%. Now it gets very interesting. That fourth is I've used the table stakes information. I've used mine and my colleagues' unique experience. And the fourth is my enterprise inside AI. Because we've got some stuff we like to keep secret. We've got some stuff we think is special. Why? 
because we believe that knowledge is an advantage. So if you are now blending your outside table stakes knowledge, your expertise, and your inside special sauce knowledge, now you may be at 80% of the race. So right now, Tom's, at, as a reminder, Tom has decided to start at the starting blocks for the million dollar race. I am at this point deciding to start at the 80 yard line. And does anyone want to take bets here on who's going to finish this more quickly? Okay. Finally, add the fifth element. And the fifth element, interesting, in this case, it's the water bottle. But that's actually what happens when you take all of that. And to Lisa's point, you circle back, you take all that knowledge, you put it together, and then you apply, you know, kind of the final diversity of thought and options and kind of that really interesting discussion, right? That what if, that human kind of magic and our curiosity that manifests. So um, who here in this million dollar race would like to start at the starting block? When I start at 90, this is why AI matters. And I'm going to give you a, a little aside. This played out for me in real life, which is part of where I was trying to wrap my hands around this graphic. And anyone, please improve this graphic. This is Alexis's like best on a weekend look. We had a particular question, and I'm going to um, try not to... Try not to get anyone in trouble. We had a question from someone a little bit like Jason's, uh, Jason's premise, where it was like, what is going to change between now and 2050, right? What is it we have to pay attention to? What's going to change between now and 2050? And we got the smartest, I mean, big brains, like big, big brains in the room. And we had workshops and separate writing and, and different jamborees. And we were all getting together for six months six months to come up with between now and 2050. What is going to be different? What is it that we need to pay attention to? And all of this information was being presented, and I was in the room when it was being presented, the first outcome, and this was in January, and so I'm being presented with the information. I was like, oh, that, you know, that makes sense. That's really interesting. I was taking it in, and I thought to myself, imagine step three in this race, starting from the third position. I wonder what the generative AI would tell me about this. So I put it in, put in a scenario, nothing special, nothing, you know, not publicly, you know, available, but I put in that scenario and then I kept asking it a little more questions, kept getting curious. Does anyone here want to guess in two minutes, two minutes, six months of work, two minutes, does anyone here want to guess the percentage of overlap between the outcomes of the two? You know the answer. Jason knows the answer. 87%. So when I say you can ignore the table stakes information at your own peril, you are choosing to start at the starting block when no one else has to. And think about the fact too, there's no barriers. This is free. I did this in two minutes with a free tool. Now, what's more interesting to me though is this, that 13%, think about the magic and the treasure in that 13%, right? Imagine if those people had spent six months starting with the 87%, they probably could have gotten to 160%, right? Or 165. So the point is that time does matter, right? We can have these relationships with information. Now, do we have to do them with intentionality? Absolutely. Do we have to do them, you know, kind of in smart and good and fair and ethical ways? Yes. But I'm going to challenge a few of those too. I'm going to so I'm going to skip a little bit of this because I want to keep them on time. Uh, but there's lots of good stuff here if anyone wants to geek out later. All right, I'm going to give you. So we're going to go ahead and talk about some of the three pitfalls as I end. So one of them is, you know, that you're going to hear a lot about in AI um, is bias, right? And I think that that's something with any tool, we have to be intentional. But I want to point something out about what happens. When I started, we talked a lot about what happens if, if you keep making things too complex. What you do is you stop actually paying attention to what you're solving and the advancements that you're making. And so with this in particular, 
one of the things when I was at Google before this role, uh, the conversation around bias and specifically racial bias, right? Specifically the idea that, you know, things were not trained to be able to adequately represent everyone. And that was absolutely true. And that was a real problem. And it was a real problem that kind of the, the organizations and industry really, you know, had ignored, but then all of a sudden was like, oh yeah, there's a problem, let's take it seriously. So what I wanna highlight is from the time that that became an actual conversation, like a true conversation in society, to the time where every single major cell phone provider upgraded their camera lens to be able to show the actual difference and the amazing spectrum of different colors and shades and melanin concentrations that we have was six months. Does anyone here know how long it took from when the car was uh, invented to when seatbelts were standard? 65 years. So I say that not because we've solved everything, but because we actually have the capability to make progress when we focus on what the progress is, right? And not just having the same conversation or the doom loop around things. Like the reality is if that's a problem, then it's on us to fix it, right? It's on us to figure out how to make it not a problem. Talk about training data here. For those of you, some of you may, may see that there is a chihuahua or a blueberry muffin, right? Some of you will see the parrot or the guacamole. Like me, if I took off my glasses, would not see any of the difference, right, between that. But again, you know, these are the types of things we have a journey. We have a way that things learn, that we train. But what's really important to understand is that AI is not magic. It is a tool and a technology that does what we tell it to do with the information we tell it to do it with. And this is why I'm so passionate about making sure that at the end of the day, it's on me, right? If I create an AI tool and I'm not intentional and bad things happen, then that should be on me, right? Because I created that tool. I took that accountability. And this is a little bit of where I want to kind of end us in thinking a bit. And the nice thing is, is um, believe it or not, you have two keynotes here who actually bookended their keynotes. So I designed the intentional beginning of this conversation and Dawn at 1.30 is gonna bring you to the end of the conversation. So, uh, so kudos to, to Dawn, because that means the pressure is really on him. But when we think about trust and, and, uh, and ethics, I'm gonna kind of tee Dawn up for this. The first one is this. I really hope we can move away from this insinuation that somehow we need new ethics in AI. The reality is that we've always been expected to be responsible for data and privacy and doing the right thing. That's the job, right? In my case of being a public servant. And by sometimes inferring that we need more, we're making it more complex, right? We're, we're actually making the, um, the accountability that I should own less when you make people kind of say, oh, what about this? What, like, no, I own it. If I designed it, if I created it, if I've chosen to leverage it, I own it. I don't need a new set of ethics, right? I need to actually exercise the one I've always been expected to have. The second one is trust. I think it's really interesting when we look at AI and we want it to be more trustworthy. So we all agreed that no one here knows how the Google it algorithm works. And no one wakes up every day and says, oh my gosh, you know, I don't know how it works, right? But yet, and the, the final thing about trust is this. We want, I think it's very something we've got to be really careful about when we want our technology to be more trustworthy than we find each other, right? So we're talking about a time where we trust government less than ever. We trust media less. We don't trust each other. We certainly don't trust each other if you're of a different political party, et cetera. But somehow we want the technology to be perfect and to be trustworthy. This is a mirror. This technology is a mirror of our relationship with knowledge and with who we are, right? The second one, and this is one that I'm really passionate about, you know, from, from my standpoint is that, so in DOD, I'm gonna trust someone with a gun. I'm gonna trust them with a $40 million plane, but I'm not gonna trust them with ChatGBT, right? Like again, you know, trust. And the final one is kind of the black box theory. So we want all the answers. We want them perfectly. We want to know exactly how something worked. I'd ask you to look at yourself, right? Uh, my husband would be such a happy, happy guy if I had a predictable operating system, 
right? If he could be like, but I put in these, you know, things and I didn't get the exact thing out that I was expecting. No, no, you didn't, right? And so again, you know, one of the things we have to understand is in our relationship with knowledge and a tool and a technology, the reality is the reason I use knowledge and not data and not information is because knowledge is what happens when information is processed by we as humans, right? It's where it actually rubs up against our experience and expertise and bias and things like that. And so that's why looking at it as a knowledge tool and understanding that when Lisa queries, she's gonna probably get something different than me because she's gonna query in a different way. And that is the way that I exercise my knowledge. So I'm gonna bring us to an end, lots of other fun things to share with you all. The last one that I'm gonna go ahead and share with you though is this, because I think it's really critical. The number one thing, if you're not gonna use AI for anything else, use it to reduce the toil on your people. When I put this picture in uh, ChatGBT4 and I asked it, all I said was give me a picture of a soldier doing their normal administrative work. I didn't say make it sad, make it look crushed, make it look you know, like their souls had been sucked out of them. I just said, do the administrative work. And so I leave you with nothing else. You know, again, relationship with knowledge, table stakes information, where do you want to start? But most importantly, toil eats purpose faster than mission will ever replace it. When you see someone who gets to actually have time to be curious, to explore, to create, they are the most human that they're going to be in that moment. I hope you give them more of those moments. Thank you so much. we're over but you know tom says you know just do we have uh one question that somebody wants to ask two if they're short you've stumped them one argument nobody disagrees with her all right so so i'll ask one because i can oh we have one there you go you have one so you have to you you have to hear my question well I suppose in general, not a well thought out question, but you, you mentioned at the beginning the uh oh moment versus the aha moment, right? And I think I think you were surprised that we didn't have more of an uh oh moment, but I, I still have uh oh moments about my dishwasher, right? So so there there's an overlap and a, a continuum of uh oh and aha. And I guess you know, how do you distinguish among those and and, and at what point do we get past uh oh completely? Yeah. Oh, I'd still your mic. Here, I'll come back to you. Yeah, I, I think that I think the reality is is that we should always expect the relationship to change, right? We should always expect it to be intentional because the reality is is that we change, right? And so our again, our assumption. So I don't look at this like a purely linear thing. I think the question is this. I'll give you a quick example. When I um do an AI 101 training. I do an A-B split and I introduce half of the people who are doing the training to generative AI using personal things. So write, write a love letter to your spouse, write a packing list, things like that. I introduce the second group, the B group professionally. And what I found exactly to your point is that people get through the uh-oh period three times faster when you introduce the personal use because our personal identity enjoys things like wonder and play, right? And, and feels more confident and more capable. If you introduce it professionally, you stick in the uh-oh moment for a long time because your professional identity has a lot of weight, right? That's how you get a paycheck. It's how you introduce yourself at parties, right? And things like that. So ultimately the reason why I started, you know, with that as kind of the identity slide is that we actually have to be willing, like Alexis has to be willing to look and say like, what does it mean for me? How do I come to grips for that? How might I have to be different? And as it changes, that changes. So it's a great point. All right, one more. 
and I'm still figuring this all out. Like I could be totally different opinion six months from now, and I reserve that, right? right. Hopefully you do too. All right, real quick, tell them who you are. Okay, uh, Gail Azeroth at Plural Side. So AI is the new must-have skill. You're part of a very large organization. How do you raise the bar across the organization so everyone understands your vision? Sure. Um, so I'll give you uh, three ways on that. So number one, I think, um, again, to the, the point of simplicity, like generative AI at least, right? So there's programming and coding AI. And quite frankly, the technology will get better and better to where we don't need the number of data scientists and things like that that we're actually recruiting for now. We just won't. Um, but I think, you know, specifically, the reality is that what we really need people to do is to actually exercise that muscle of curiosity, right, and the relationship with words. So I'm doing another piece of research right now. I'm not done with it. But specifically, there was an assumption with prompt engineering, right, how you query um, these tools that the normal cadre would be the best at it, the engineers you know, the coders, the data scientists, they would be what you really, really need to have this incredible relationship with knowledge. Um, they do not do as well as lawyers, public affairs people, communicators, and others. And so I'm going back now to my organization from a talent lens and saying, if we want to have, if the relationship with knowledge is actually how we exercise our adversarial advantage, then we actually have to have a different mindset about who is most qualified and who is naturally good at this. And so what we're starting to see is instead of those normal, you know, Air Force Research Lab, STEM, 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 now it's like, wow, our PR person may be an, a, an untapped weapon, right, in this. Our, uh, you know, our public affairs person may have an incredible amount to offer. But I say that as the root of why I think it's so important that we let this be a human tool. Right, and that we understand that those human behaviors of curiosity, et cetera, are actually what make them powerful and why we've got to get all the other stuff, the toil out of the way, because right now our people don't actually have the bandwidth or time to be curious, right? Now we beat the curiosity out of them. Uh, you know, we do anything. And so the point is, is like, that's the behavior we want. So how is it that we do things? And the last punchline I'll give you on that is um, I'm introducing a kill bonus. So what I mean by that is that I am literally paying people to stop doing things. In DOD, we create pretty well, we maintain really, really well, and we destroy almost nothing. And you can't have renewal and new if you're not willing to stop things. And so part of what I'm trying to figure out is how I incentivize that. And, uh, first of all, let's give Alexis a great round of applause. Are you gonna be here for a little bit? She'll be here for a little bit in case you do have some follow-up questions outside, but one of the things we talked about last night that I thought was really important about this, and I think you'll see this as a theme today, is, is getting the workforce to understand not just what AI is, but what it can do and how it can kind of fill in those holes and not be afraid, or uh, you, you used the term last night, um, we don't want to beat the innovation out of people or beat the curiosity. So anyways, uh, let's start with the next panel. Frank, uh, Frank Conkle is going to moderate. Uh, uh, he told me just have everyone come up at once. So come up at once. And uh, I'm going to do a little more trivia while they do this, because that's what I do. So I, I told you guys previously about 2012, and I told you all previously about 2018. So let's jump forward to 2030, sorry, uh, when we talk about emerging technologies. And here's another, this is from um, a report from Kiplinger's about how technology will change our lives by 2030. So something else to think about. This is what Kiplinger say. They say your refrigerator will shop for you. They'll monitor your inventory, ask you for approval, and then, and then order your groceries. Drones will be delivering your packages to your doorstep, taking 30 minutes or less, like Domino's Pizza. And implanted microchips will track and help you manage your health issues and communicate to your doctor in real time. So that's, that's six years from now. So again, I did 2012. We talked about cloud disease prevention, AI powered informatics. We talked about 2018, 3D metal printing, more AI services, and now 2030. So with that, Frank, take it away. Cool. Thank you, Jason. Okay, well, we have a big panel, so I don't really wanna give too uh, long intros. I'm gonna start with Tom, just uh, here on my left. Go down, introduce yourselves, your role, and then we'll get started. We're, this panel is all gonna be about Sort of future proofing <laughs> how they're trying to reach how these fellows are trying to reshape their uh, agencies here sure uh tom Sosela, i'm the uh, deputy director of office of enterprise management in the department of the army 
Uh, and we're really responsible for all the defense business systems for the entire army, as well as the newly appointed uh, performance improvement office. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Jason Bonander. I'm the deputy CIO for the Centers for Disease Contro Control and Prevention. Bruce Bagnell, the principal deputy CIO for Department of State. Uh, I oversee all the IT on a, uh, around the world at our missions. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Frank Indiviglio. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for NOAA. We've been there for 15 years and worked in HBC before becoming the CTO. Good morning. My name is Gerald Karen. I am the Chief Information Officer for the International Trade Administration at the Department of Commerce. I'm James Fitch. I'm with Red Hat, and I'm the Sales Director over a lot of the federal civilian agencies. Uh, good morning, I'm Stephen Brand, Deputy CIO for Resource Management at the Department of Energy. If I might, Alexis, thanks for the shout out to folks who have uh, social science degrees. That was excellent. Uh, Don Bauer, Chief Technology Officer for Global Talent at the Department of State. All right. Well, it's the first panel of the day. We've got to try to have some energy, guys. So to dive right in, I don't care who takes this first question, but Let's get to what's one step right now you're taking to reform or lead some reform, uh, future proofing your agency uh, that you reside in. I'm going to get a couple of you guys and we're going to move through some questions. I will say too, uh, around 930 ish, we'll start raising your hands and then we'll just take your questions because the chances are they're better than mine. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I said uh, that I'd take the first stop shot at this one um, because I want to kind of uh, piggyback on that social science thing. I One of the things that I've found that agencies need to do and something I think we often forget is that it's not just the technologists that need training. Um, so one of the things that we've undertaken in the Department of Energy is to try to help our cores and financial managers, attorneys, uh, CEOs, folks who are buying things like artificial intelligence to understand it. Because so often, if you ask somebody about AI or even cloud, which is which is you know the previously the shiny object, those folks in those communities kind of nod, oh, cloud, yeah, yeah, cloud, and they don't know. And they're better advisors if they understand it. And so we are taking the initiative to give them some foundational training, right? Not trying to make them experts, but so they have a, a stronger foundation in those technology areas, so that they can be better advisors for the uh, for their customers. Just to tag a little, attach a little bit to that. I, I think, you know, we talk about technology and it's really important, but it's a tool that we were talking about this morning. Uh, it's more of a people, it's a cultural change, right? So how do you feature proof, proof that culture? That's training, right? But, and that's giving people access to tools. Again, another thing that was mentioned in the talk before us is, you know, that, that time horizon is six months instead of years. And that doesn't really line up with how we operate. Uh, we don't operate on a six month time frame. I wish we did, right? But so how do you give those people tools? How do you give those people uh, access to things and really communicate with them? They have to be the center of the change. The technology is just around them. So really it's building that change in, in, in terms of people and not technology. Yep. Um, I'll add to that. So one of the key things is mo most of the technology really is driven by the customers, right? They're, they're the ones that say, this is my new business requirement. For example, public affairs, they're creating news articles on a daily basis. At the same time, they could care less about how AI works. So as as mentioned earlier, what we what we try to do is how do we connect the data in a way that's transparent to them, but then allow them to access that data so at least they can get that 80% solution when they're using AI to do the initial drafts, for example. Another methodology is creating training. We have an entire training center. We've created training not for the IT professional, but for those users who then can use that technology to then do their jobs. In addition, what we've done is we've we tried to push so that each bureau has something called the chief data officer who then is able to take the data and form those relationships across the bureaus. So again, the users don't really care as long as those connections have been made in the background. And if I can just add one thing, you know, for CDC as a scientific organization, we have curiosity in spades across the entire organization. We have nothing but curious people. And so we do have uh, lots of people close to the mission who are want or 
really chomping at the bit um, to use AI to figure out how to how it can improve population health, health equity, as well as our operational pieces. But you know, the other piece for CDC that's a that's a challenge or a tension is between, and we saw this also in spades during COVID, is speed versus accuracy. And for us, the work that we do, not only just our brand, uh, but what we produce is trying to balance that tension. And I think AI is going to knock that tension out. Jason, are there any rules for the road that you guys are using to govern how you're bringing in AI? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Thanks. Thanks for that question. So we are, we've, we've developed uh, guidelines internally. So to Alexis's point, we haven't shut anything off. We're allowing um, folks uh, or supporting folks to use AI to think about how to how it can be applied to their mission. Uh, we do have internal guidance and guidelines uh, for all of our staff, both our scientific staff and our, and our administrative staff for ways uh, to use AI, uh, AI ChatGPT to support their work. Um, in addition, uh, and also to Alexa's point, we have uh, we've created an instance inside our environment to ensure that because we do have a fair amount of sensitive data, and we do want to try to provide some guardrails uh, for how that data is used and managed in this context. Yeah, time guard. Yeah, I just want to add one thing. So uh, on Alexa's comment about ChatGPT, and and I'll just be a little bit kitschy here, but you know we when we give someone a forty million dollar aircraft, we train them for five to seven years to fly it. Um, that's probably why we don't trust people with chat GPT. Um, they just simply don't know what they're using and the impacts of using it, right? Uh, and I, I would just say, I'm, I'm, I had this conversation with Jason last night, right? Um, there's a lot of vendors that couldn't spell AI two years ago, but suddenly they're all experts in it now. Um, no offense to the vendors, I used to be one. <laughs> um, but, but the point is, is it's earning effort right and so to become an expert in something it takes time and training and diligence right um and going to a 24-hour scrum master class does not make you a master right it's like a dive master right it takes it's an eight-year program to become a dive master right and so i don't think we're far enough in our ai journey to say that anyone here is an expert in it right on how to use it what are the impacts of using it what are the cross sections of the society versus the technology it's complicated I will tell you, however, something else Alexa said this morning that I thought was interesting, and it's a good point, uh, and I guess we are countercultural here in the Army, is we have reduced our defense business system portfolio by 50% in the last five years, right? Uh, we went from 800 down to 480 some odd systems, right? And on our way down to 200 and some odd systems. Um, so we are divesting things, right? Uh, the, the way that we're doing future proofing, though, is not by divesting things, but understanding what we have. The gut spends enough time figuring out what they have, right? Uh, it's a black box. Um, we're guessing what we own and who's operating and who's using it. Um, so I encourage everyone here, whether you're in the private sector or public sector, right? Just take the time to baseline what you have. That is the most important thing to understand what your launching point is, the race analogy, right? Um, you can start from zero, right? But if you don't know what you have, you don't know where the start line is, right? Um, and if you can use chat GPT, so be it. Yeah, speaking of, well, uh, yeah, when you're from the boss, we haven't had it. No, that's that's fine. I thought I would uh, give something from an industry perspective because I'm at Red Hat and I work with a lot of the federal civilian agencies, places like Department of Energy and NASA and USDA, where you have a very heavy scientific community. And one of the things that I started to see is really cross collaboration between the different departments and the organizations within the industries that I cover. It's really allowed that opportunity to come forward. And with with AI, you know, time frame to make decisions really gets cut significantly. So people can make better informed decisions in a much quicker period of time. I know we have tools internally that do a lot of work that me as a manager can gather more information on how, how people are doing and what they're doing and activities they're involved in and other different things that I, I find to be extremely helpful. Yeah. So, you know, when you talk about guardrails, um, I'm the, I run the HR platforms at the department. If there's any profession right now that's more threatened by artificial intelligence, it's human resources. And amazingly enough, a ton of people came up and said, we want to use this technology. And, you know, and of course, the State Department is very forward-leaning on AI. They have encouraged us to go out and get ChatGPT and things like that. 
but there was this conversation around guardrails. So uh, as a CTO for HR, they're all like, what are we gonna do? And I'm like, well, maybe we should have some training and really work to get a common understanding of what this technology offers to the organization. So this is really thinking from a standpoint when Alexis is talking about our PA folks and our, uh, you know, the non-technical folks are better at this. Well, I have a whole ton of non-technical folks, which I struggle with daily to even from an interpretation standpoint of how I'm implementing technology and how they understand how it's being done. So we took a couple of days and did we did a little summit internal for HR. We brought speakers in and we really just worked to just get a baseline understanding of what AI was and the fact that chat GPT is not the only thing out there. There's machine learning, there's all these other opportunities and each has a, its very specific uh, application. So that's how we've approached it. And of course the department's been, has already, ha we have our internal policy. So we have a, a good, I think, foundation right now. And the other thing that we did, and for those that are feds in here will appreciate this, if you're using a tool like this in an official capacity, you're generating records, okay? So, and if you're not aware, ChatGPT does allow you to export history. So we put together a very lightweight framework around the fact that if you get a State Department account and you're using ChatGPT to do your job, you export your chat history and we're gonna give that to our e-records folks. So if there's any conversations, especially if you think about HR and liability, right? The, the, the fact that we're going to be using technology to make decisions about people, it's more important that we have some lineage behind that to show how we are actually managing it and, and tracking. Sure. Well, doing all that uh, good work, Don, because if you do too good of a job, it might replace you <laughs> sooner. Uh, this might be the last panel you ever do, dude. That is a real concern. <laughs> uh, Gerald, we haven't heard from you yet. What are you hiding? It's okay. <laughs> I don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we did an offsite similar to talk about, you know, all of our users were talking about AI, AI, you know, the shiny object thing. So we did an offsite with some key individuals. It was, it was pretty well attended. And, you know, we were trying to garner out what do you, what is it you're saying you want to do? You're excited about this technology, but what is it? And they'd say, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do that. And just about everything that came up was not AI related at all. It was like, no, that's a people process procedure kind of thing. Um, but we did get down to a use case and one of the struggles we've been having is, is there's a lot of coaching involved, um, in, in what is it that you wanted to do now? AI is great because I can ask in a natural language, some questions rather than doing the hunting and pecking, like I do on, you know, the internet and trying to figure out, is this the right thing? Is this the right thing? I, I ask in a natural language. I don't have to figure out keywords and I get some output, but when you have, been running websites that are hard to navigate, have outdated information. What do you think the AI is going to output if, if people are asking that information? So there's still some people process procedure things if you have information that you're providing out. Um, so it's very important to understand that there's some work in the back end because it's, you know, you don't want to put out garbage. Um, so you really got to be sure that you are updating your information to be sure that when people ask questions, you're giving them the right information. It's, you know, the, it was just the thought process that they thought it was automagical, that it was going to give the correct answer no matter what. And that's not the truth. Um, and then also there's the, some of the privacy concerns, making sure that we um, cordon off the things that we don't want it outputting, that it just doesn't have all its tentacles into all the information because you don't, there's a lot of information you don't want it going out. So, you know, you have to be able to protect that, those things that you don't want it to answer out too. So there's a lot of coaching involved. It's not as easy as throwing the tool in and automatically is going to give all the correct information all the time. So there is a lot of coaching involved. Gerald, you're worth the wait. You're the last one to talk and you did a good job. <laughs> don't ask me any more questions. That's it. I'm tired. Just go sit down. <laughs> Just have a seat. Stephen, you have something you want to add to that? I just thought of an interesting anecdote about... Um, what, what information comes back. We also have to be uh, careful about what gets uploaded. Um, early on, we had some folks who were asking uh, ChatGPT to help debug some code. But in, in order to do that, you got to upload the code. And we have to be careful about where is that going? Because then there were some reports about somebody somewhere else in the world saying, give me all of the code that's been uploaded at the Department of Energy, for example. 
Um, and so you have to be very careful about that. And this is another thing that when we have users who aren't trained, um, and as Tom, I think it's a great point, no no one can point to themselves and say that they're an expert. So that's a, just another thing. Your, your point just made me think of that uh, anecdote. Another thing that we have to be careful about. Yeah, that uh, I want to do a kind of a lightning round session in a second. So we'll stay with you, Stephen. But it just um, going back to what uh, Mr. Sasala was saying about the government needing to be a little bit better or agencies need to be better about documenting what they're what, what kind of programs they already have. GAO did a pretty decent uh, thorough report a few months back saying there was something like 1200 different AI related programs in government. But is there, is there anyone from GAO in the audience at this conference today? That's great. There's not. So on background, they were saying there were several hundred other applications that were like wishy-washy that could have been AI related that were planned, but we're not really sure what they are. So I think that point that you made, Tom, is really good. It's difficult to even get the bearings of what's going on in some of your agencies. There's some of them are big, you know, we're talking tens and hundreds of thousands of folks. Well, and I would actually argue that AI is an enabler, right? We're not going out and buying AI, right? We're buying something with AI in it, right? And so if you you literally go out to buy AI, you're probably buying the wrong thing. <laughs> so AI enabled this, AI enabled that, right, is probably the right answer. And we had the same query, right? It might have came from the GO, uh, GA, uh, GAO or not, but um, two questions we could ask annually. How much do we spend on cloud and how much are we spending on AI now, right? Um, and the shorter answer is we have no idea because of that reason, right? AI could be in just about anything. And it is is, let's say it's in the Abrams tank, for example. Is it the total cost of the tank or is it the cost of just the AI in the tank, right? I, I don't know what the question wasn't specific, right? And uh, 1,200, I think the Army has 1,200 things going on with AI right now. <laughs> so I think that part's a little soft. <laughs> there you go. Um, all right, we'll stay with you, Tom. We're going to go right down. If you give this audience, who's it's probably a mix of, uh, how much is government? How many folks are from the, the government here? Two, three, four. That's pretty decent. That's pretty decent. Okay, so we got a good mix. Give your your government peers one piece of advice if they're considering or contemplating migrating uh, applications to AI. They're making that decision, getting the business case for it. One solid piece of advice. This could throw a bone to some of the reporters in the audience as well who are curious about what you're doing, what you plan to do. Uh, and Tom, we'll start with you. And then James, you, you'll be able to give advice. Yeah, I'll give it in this perspective. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, the number one piece of advice I would say is uh, just remember who your customer is. Um, Human-centered design is paramount for making a solution that people will use. Uh, when they express a problem, you will rapidly discover that the problem they express is not the problem they're trying to solve. And so keeping them in the loop throughout the process is paramount and critical. Jason. Yeah, I'll, the one thing I, I appreciate that's a great perspective. I'll 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 emphasize. I think Alexa spent mentioned this right at the right at the end. Like focus on focus on the non sexy things, right? So for us, uh, some of the things that we're focusing on right now are dealing with FRN notice responses, right? Things that our attorneys get thousands or hundreds of thousands of responses are helping them go through that process to disposition that content. Uh, the one thing I'd like to add um, is that it, it's really time, especially within government agencies, to break the silos. Everybody likes to hoard their own data. They don't like to share. And it takes you six months just to talk to the office right next door. So, again, it's critical to actually start merging all the data sources and then coordinating that data. And then you can easily apply your cyber controls that you need to apply around that data. Um, so I think there's a there's a couple of things. One one is the uh, be be intentional in your purpose of the application, right? Traditional AI, we we kind of have a handle on how do we do that, right? With generative AI, it's a shiny new thing, as we said more than once today. And it, and you know everyone's got that hammer, and everything looks like a nail now, right? So how do we do that, and how do we be intentional about how we deploy it? The other side of it is is in the how you deploy it, right? Most of the work that you're going to do is going to be around putting those guardrails in, putting that application together. We're not going out and developing fun, fun foundational models, but we're going to do a lot of work around them to make them safe, right? Think about a weather context. If, if you get weather information out of a, um, a generative AI model, uh, that's a really good thing because you can understand that, that weather data probably way more than you can if I just gave you a bunch of weather data because uh, I wouldn't understand it either. Um, but I... I you as a consumer and me as a consumer would need to know where that data came from. Is it accurate? Did it come from NOAA? Did it come from somewhere else? 
was it interpreted, right? So it's really, a, a, we have to focus on how we deliver the information that comes out of these things. Oh, you, you. Um, one, one of the things I like that we do at, at ITA is I'm, I'm not a product owner. My business units that I support within the organization, they're the product owners. They own the product from start to finish. They dictate the requirements. They dictate the user testing. I just do the IT. They have the needs. I don't make up the needs. I don't do the sake of, I don't do IT for the sake of doing IT. We do the solutioning for them, but they decide what it is is important that they need. And then we decide collectively with all our business units together, we decide what is it IT is going to do this quarter and deliver. And we do that every quarter, and that's what we focus on delivering. They decide what we do. Now, it takes a little bit of flexibility away from me. I still have the things that I have to do because federal mandates and things like that, that's well understood. But when it comes to um, me being an enabler of the mission, it's not for me to decide what that mission is or what their priorities are. So we let them dictate it. But they have to dedicate the resource to man manage the product from start to finish the whole time. So for that aspect, we are able to better deliver the things that they really want rather than the old days where we were playing tennis, right? They hit the ball over the fence, say, I need something. I'd hit it back. I'd say, is this right? Nope, hit it back. And then you're, you're playing that tennis. Whereas now we're, we're having a discussion, they're dictating and it's, they're responsible for getting it right and getting the requirements right. And we just do the work. So for that aspect, we always deliver more on what the real need is rather than trying to figure it out. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give a little bit of an industry perspective. So one of the things that's important is both industry people and ourselves and the, the government customers are working together to define specific workable use cases that we can apply AI to. Don't try to boil the ocean with this either. Don't try to hit a home run first. Try to find a workable situation that you can show value in together that's going to generate the customer added value with an AI solution that you're going to be able to support. And then you can build upon that in, in working with them. And you brought up the security concern as well. That's very important as well. Um, you're dealing with data that needs to be secure. Let's let's make sure you're creating environment that's not trying to take, take too much on in, into itself when you're starting out with these initiatives. All right, the one key thing I would give, actually echo some points that were made earlier, but determine your use case first, then determine the tool. Um, a AI is a means and not an end in itself. I would say that based on my research and trying to uh, herd the cats that I deal with on a regular basis, uh, there, Chris Whitlock, who's a very uh, prominent figure in the AI community, has been for years, really speaks to risk, okay? And if you think about security, everything we do is about risk. It's And even what Alexis talked about, right? The black box, do I believe it, do I not? Am I willing to take the risk? And then if you look at the spectrum of AI with respect to what it's good at and what it's not good at, okay? So it's really good at copy, editing, correcting. It's pretty good at translating, okay? It's really good at summarizing, okay? But when you start asking it to expand on something or infer something, all right, the risk goes up. And as the risk goes up, then you have a responsibility from a leadership standpoint to know what you're dealing with when you start increasing your risk. So the exposure of AI really says, if you're using it for what it's really good at, it's low risk. Turn your people loose, let them go for it. But as that risk starts to increase, to me, more and more oversight and more understanding needs to happen with the provenance, where things are coming from, where they're going, so that, to Jerry's point, make sure what's being spit out isn't wrong. Because if people are making decisions based on the output of this magical tool, then you need to understand the risk. Got it. I'm jotting some notes. It's surprisingly cluttered up here on this podium. <laughs> uh, well, focus on the customer. Also focus on the unsexy, which is counterintuitive for me, but I think I like I like that one. I'm used to it. Um, <laughs> try to minimize focusing. <laughs> I do it every time I look in the mirror, dude. Nobody's focusing. Cut down on risk as we can. 
Um, and there was one about breaking down silos with, I'm thinking of that as um, you guys are CTOs and CIOs predominantly, but you have other C-suite counterparts in your agencies. I'm wondering how this emergence of technology is making you work more with some of your near peers, um, your leaders. How are you engaging more if you are? And how does that dynamic work? I'm always curious about that anyway, but I feel like in this conversation, um, it's kind of more magnified. And well, I would tell you, uh, and Bruce is right. The uh, the silo effect is real is real, and and having that cl cross collaboration. But let's be honest, AI has just accelerated the speed of how bad data can get perpetuated. Right. So now we're in a situation where you really have to make sure it's clear. And I think the other side of all this has been, you know, especially in the federal context, we have shadow systems pop up all over the place. Right. Bob's desktop with his access database has all this information. Well, now, now think about how if Bob uses that as the source for his AI generation, that becomes a leadership conversation that says, well, it says we have 50 of these. It's like, well, no, actually we have 500, but nobody knew because of this other thing, which really goes back to the actual data. So I think that's where I'm focusing right now is, is systems of record and really making sure we have clean data because as that sharing starts to get much more uh, easy to do and more important, uh, data quality really becomes good. Anyone else want to have a stab at that one on engagement with your sort of your peers, C-suite conference? Yeah, sure. I'll jump in. So it, it's not just the C-suite for us, right? Um, yes, you can just wait for the Vitor scorecard to come out and punch you in the face. That's one option. <laughs> but in reality, it's getting not only them involved, but again, since we're on a global scale, we we have to constantly engage with like, or ministries, you have to engage with local telecom companies in those individual countries. So we've created a different type of, of approach to get key interlocutors to be involved in the conversations at the start. And back at headquarters, it's more about, okay, what do you really want to do? Are you willing to commit to be responsible in doing that? Again, um, I think Don mentioned it, as your risk level does go up, then you have to pull it back. In one particular case, we realized that what people really wanted to use it was involve HVAs at a certain degree. That means we can't just use ChatGPT when we're accessing those data. So now we could have created a one-off solution or that IT organization in that one bureau could have created it. But instead what we said is, let's just create one that goes across the entire thing. So that way we're again able to share the data. So that's what we're in the process of doing. Right. No one else wanted to take a stab at that, eh? Steve, you always yeah. get signs. So I was thinking about this. The, the way we talked about this earlier is um, how this engagement and collaboration uh, enables us to be able to be more efficient when we're, I took this to mean efficiency with customers, with citizens who want to engage our various departments. And, and so I think that in most CIO shops, we are inward facing, right? We're facing inward into the agency. But it's our peers and other parts of the departments or agencies that are outward facing. So we 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 have to collaborate with them because you know going back to this idea of use cases, um, we may be thinking about how we can make our networks and systems more secure. We can never forget about that, but we have to do it in a way that continues to make it efficient for customers, for citizens to engage with the departments and agencies. So that engagement and collaboration with our peers outside of the CIO shops, I think is is critical. I'm curious, you guys, um, we have not had normal budget seasons in a long time. We're talking about planning for the future. How much does that challenge you all? Because I have to imagine as someone who watches this stuff and reports on it from the outside, it just has to make your jobs like 10 times harder. Way more than 10. Well, let's hear it. Like, give me, give me, give me a good sound bite or two so I can call you later. <laughs> Not to, not to sound the sound, sound bite guy. Um, look, this year is, I don't know what it was about this year, but the confluence environmental events um, combined with the budgetary issues that we have and then the politics we have. Um, the Department of the Army writ large is reserving money for things that we don't normally reserve money for. In this case, a couple wars, <laughs> uh, kinetic and non-kinetic engagements across the globe. Right, that money that is in reserve is not is not there for those purposes. It's there for something else. Right, 
So what we're seeing is a spending environment that is the most constrained that I have ever seen in the you know 30 plus years that I've been doing this job, um, at least working for the Department of Defense and Intelligence Community, right? Um, and I'll just give you an example, uh, just from my own personal experience, because as a deputy, I get to follow our budget and manage it by the penny, if you remember those, those days, Stephen. Um, we paid our civ pay bill, the civilian pay for our salary, and I had 89 cents in my checking account um, to pay the next bill, which is a million and a half dollars for a contractor, right? Um, and I went back to our finance people and I said, we need more money. And they said, there's no more money. And I'm like, well, I can't bounce a check, right? And we, we can't. Somehow the government goes into deficit, but I can't bounce a check. So I'm not entirely sure how that works. There's your soundbite. <laughs> um, so this holding back and throttling of the funding, not only because of the lack of an appropriations bill and lack of the authorizers and the appropriators getting together, it's just a matter of how do we manage episodic environmental impacts when you're budgeting five years in advance? You know, Alexa said everything's like a six months turn. That's ridiculous. If I have to Today, we are working on Palm 26, right? I got to predict through FY29 what I'm going to spend money on. I don't know about you guys. That is a just, it's pointless. It's utterly pointless. <laughs> you know, I, I'll add to that. So certainly there's a challenge. I'm not going to repeat what you said. So, uh, but certainly for us at CDC during COVID, uh, a, a huge amount of supplementals came in to the department. Uh, to to fund a wide variety of activities, everything from new mission activities, new surveillance systems, new ways to discover outbreaks, to the foundational technologies supporting all of that. And so now with all of those supplements gone, we built some extraordinary programs, public health programs, some extraordinary infrastructure for which there's no core funding for these things. So we are, like probably everyone else here, faced with some pretty significant challenges, but I, I really appreciated Al, uh, Alexis's note of, you know, maybe we, we do, we haven't quite gotten there yet, but what we need is some kill bonuses. We, we need to figure out, so what matters most? You know, how much of legacy or some of the other things that we have been doing are comfortable doing need to be killed uh, to shift some aspect of remaining budgets to some of these more advanced things. And then also, and I, you know, I hate to say it, but think about the return on investment, and I and I, you mentioned this from an HR perspective, and it's true, right? So how how many resources can we stop funding? And I'll, resources, I'll leave that vague. Uh, can we stop funding in order to to uh, shift those dollars into some of those things? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think one of the challenges I have with oh God, I'm going to start crying when we talk about budget. <laughs> Um, one, one of the things I, with me is, you know, there's, there's the sticker price on a car and that's what people see. And they say, that's a great price. I'm going to buy that car. They don't think of the total cost of ownership of having that car, you know, tires, there's wear and tear, there's oil changes and things you pay extra for, maybe you buy the package, but you're still paying extra on top of that. There, there's other costs that are associated with owning that car. It's not just the sticker price. Sometimes all of our you know, people that I support, they see the sticker price and you have to try to explain to them, that's great. You're getting a great deal on that, but I have to maintain it and sustain it. And can I do that? And I don't have the resources. I need additional resources. I, my team's already, and then we already have federal mandates, which are usually unfunded, um, that, that it's must do work as, this, as being in the IT business. I have to do these things. I can't not do these things. I have to do these things if we're going to have an IT shop. So there's only so many dollars left over after that. Now it's dictated by my customers what I do and they give me that money. But sometimes it's like, why does it cost so much? Well, you're just looking at the sticker price. Here's why I need to be able to sustain it. I need to be able to do an, an assessment on this. I need to secure it, things like that. There's these additional costs and it's always trying to get them to understand that it's just not that sticker price and that you need more money in order to do this. And there's only a finite amount of money. Also, one of the things that we have is there's a new program because there's a new priority for the department and it's a, it's a big priority. And the thought process is this has nothing to do with IT. I don't have to talk to the IT shop. Well, yeah, it's not an IT project or is it not an IT initiative, but there is sometimes and always an IT tail to it that they don't realize. 
Um, and it's usually too late by the time they realize that. And there's no money there because they put all their money in. So there's always that discussion. So being more involved and trying to insert myself more in what's going on in the organization as a whole, whether it's IT um, priority or not, or strictly IT or not, is very important because then I can say there is an IT aspect to that that you're going to need to um, compensate for. So, you know, Jerry, if I, if I can build on that. So, just a question How many people here have a Netflix subscription? How many people have a Hulu subscription? How many people have an Amazon subscription? All right. So, right, this is IT today, right? We are dealing with subscriptions, subscription based models uh, that have a perpetual tail. Right. And it's a tale that's almost the same, if not more, than what it started with, which is a very different cost model than we've dealt with in the past. And I think that's fundamentally changing budgets and changing how we forecast what that future is. Yeah. And I'll just add to that. So there was the longest time that I thought that a subscription model would make it easier for me to plan. Right. Um, I, I don't know how it did not, but it does not. And so to all the vendors here, please, uh, you know, perpetual licenses are just fine with me at this point. Right. Um, but the, I really thought like, oh, we, we just add up all of our subscriptions and this is how much we need to put into the budget. And then, you know, we got 50 percent of our money. What do you do when you have subscriptions at this level, but you're, the funding you get annually is down here? Right. And so we call those must pay bills. Our budget shop calls them UFERS. I'm like, it's not an unfunded requirement. It's an unbudgeted. It's an, like you didn't put money in it. It's not my fault. It's not, it's, it's not an unknown requirement. Exactly right. Um, it's a well-documented requirement, unfunded or otherwise, right? Um, and that is literally the, the challenge that I am facing this year, right? We have $20 million worth of bills and I got $7 million worth of budget. What do I do with that $12 million, right? It's a problem. Um, and I think everyone here is facing the same issue. Let's, um, it, let's open it up to some audience questions here. I can just add one item. Oh, um, so one of the things that's not taken account, this is really for my federal colleagues, is that you have ramp up time and then you have decommissioning time. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're enduring two costs, right? The cost to sustain something until the new system is in place. Historically, when we were doing this in our organization, we our ramp up time could take anywhere from 18 months to five years. Yes, yeah, so is that ridiculous? The only way to reduce, it, especially with the current budget environment, was how do we accelerate it or have that overlap to be a lot less? And yeah. so we've taken most of our project, and we've actually got IT people that can do project management now. That's a new concept. And we're able to crunch that time down to within one fiscal year or less, be able to flip the systems over. And that's really, um, it's going to hurt for that one year that you're flipping, but then your your tail costs to sustain that new system should be a lot less than trying to manage new systems. Yeah, and explaining that crossover cost to the senior leaders who really have no concept of an IT tail is quite challenging. And you know, for the army, deploying something to a million people across the globe takes a long time. So we found that nearly impossible. And and you know, even when you have systems that are new systems, then you get delayed. And but you pulled the money out of the old systems to pay for the new system. Um, it, there's this massive snowball effect, and that ball just keeps getting bigger. And they're more brittle, they're more fragile, they're costing more to maintain over the years because of less cybersecurity, you have more money into them. Um, and it's not a fixed cost. There's all these variable costs that just are simply not accounted for by the people who are handing down the money. Now, look, we get a lot of money, but it's spread across a lot of things, right? So that's the challenge. Don, I want to see you go down there and testify in front of Congress and do that. <laughs> I, I, I would go just to watch. Frank, uh, give him the mic. Give him the mic. Give him the mic. Yeah. Take the mic, Don. So I want to say I I belong to the multi-agency executive steering committee, which is a large body of CFO agencies at OPM. And magically, an OMB rep has started to attend our meetings. And let me tell you, every time he shows up, I'm like, okay, you guys need to do something. He's like, well, we we really appreciate your goals to modernize. <laughs> I'm like, why are we not getting any funding? He goes, well, if you don't get the funding, you let me know. So I have his email. Gonna have to let him know. I'm sure he talks just like that too. All right, Frank, we got a question from uh, this gentleman right here. Tell me who you are. Steve. Don't touch my mic. 
Steve Wabrowski from Genesis, um, nice to meet you gentlemen, and it's an excellent conversation, but while we're dancing around budget cycles, and let's pretend that it's actually a normal budget year one day, um, the procurement cycle itself, if the emerging, if the event horizon or change horizon is six months, and the procurement cycle is, well, a little more than that, um, right, just old-fashioned telecom technology and migration and transformation has been behind how, what is the concept? Are you trying, what are you doing to change the procurement process? And are you leaning on OTAs? Are you looking at, I don't know if Bonnie Evangelista is here. I don't want to step on her toes, but if she's not, what is the strategy to accelerate the procurement of this stuff? Because by the time you get it, you know, you're way behind as far as what the technology is, let alone the time to deploy it. So I will tell you, I made this comment years and years ago um, where I stated the far has just gone simply too far, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the reality is procurement times are long, but they don't have to be. If you actually dig into the FAR, you look at the rules, there are ways to do contracting, not acquisition, right? Contracting in an expeditious manner. It doesn't require the use of an agreement and, and sidestepping all the uh, the traditional contracting rules, right? Um, uh, someone's up here said it earlier. I don't can't remember who it was about risk. It all comes down to risk and protest, right? And so I just, I just finished a source selection for cloud migration. Um, we finished the source selection board in July. We awarded in January. Um, that entire time was us wordsmithing the award document for the lawyers to protest, protect ourselves, right? And make sure that every one of our individual findings was sound and solid, traced back to the requirements, paced back to the instructions. And look, you anyone in here who has not been in the government, has not had the pleasure of working the other side of an acquisition, needs to take a little journey with us for about a year and sit on one of these things. It, it is no joke, right? And people, no offense, I was on the other side as well, right? Oh, it takes too long to set whatever. Yeah, I, I mean, stop protesting and you'll get awards faster. That's a joke. Don't quote me on that, right? But that's part of the problem, right? And so I'll just stop right there. <laughs> I'm passionate about this as he is. <laughs> so I've got an article coming out, so nobody snoop me on this one. Um, you got that, Frank? Don't scoop him. Don't scoop me. Thank you. That's right. But I think that one of the things that we miss out on in this community, feds and government, is when we when I attend an IT summit like this, we talk about the problems with contracting, and the contracting folks are not in the room. I like yeah. to think I personally have a foot in both realms, but they're usually not in the room to hear what these concerns are or even the ideas that you have. When I go to an NCMA conference and it's a room full of contracting folks, they talk about the IT people screwing things <laughs> up. All the time. And there are no IT people in the room to hear all of those lessons learned. Can you, get, so, can you give him his, his phone number, his email address? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we we have to cross pollinate that and um, don't scoop my article because I'm going to say that. You so. got a contractor sitting right next to you. James, you want to? Well, oh, great point, but I'm talking about contracting officers, uh, government okay. contracting officers. Yeah. Pyramid guys, yeah. Oh, do we have two of them over there? I, I got. We question. have a unicorn over there. I got Hold a question on. right here. Problem solved now, right? <laughs> All right, but here, here. Before I ask Sandy, ask her question. Tom, did you get protested? We did not. Oh, there you go. And I was right. shocked. <laughs> All right. You never have to worry about me protesting. I'm just a consultant. <laughs> Sandy Mestri, um, let's take the question. The question I have is really around the talent. All of you have been mandated to have an AI officer. You know, another new position within your organizations in the C-suite. What in your, whether it's controversial or not, what in your mind makes a good, what are the skill sets needed to be a good AI, AI officer? You don't need training in AI. You don't need training in AI. I don't know if I agree with that, but you need more people skills than technical skills. Yes, that's right. You need to be the great negotiator because there's a lot of governance in there. Messy is not a word I would use, but it, people have feelings about things, and uh, I think it's it's more of a it's more of a soft skill position. That's my opinion, right? Um, but I, I think in general, right, the talent um, on on the technical side that leads up to that person, they're all going to have to do that, right? I think the theme here has been we're all a team, whether they're contracting officers, tech people, customers, whatever. We are all one unit, and we sometimes don't act that way. So that that's the kind of role I, I see those kind of people bringing together, and, and even in in the world we live in, right? We want to push decisions down. That has to go all the way down. So, 
That's right. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to say that we have a unicorn, but sort of our chief data officer is acting as our chief AI officer. And he's an, also an epidemiologist. So he's, he's analytical, has the sort of that data, big data background. And he's also, to your point, he is a master ne negotiator. He is a human person who works a lot across the organization to build bridges. And so he does those three things. Really, I got another question, unless if someone wants to jump in on one more. Sure. I just want to be clear. I didn't really mean that you don't have to know anything about AI. So. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Go ahead. All right. Tell me who you are. Hi, uh, Elisa Fiola from GSA as a uh, cybersecurity advisor. Um, I question for y'all, because I love that y'all mentioned unfunded requirements. Have y'all traced your unfunded requirements to system POAMs? Because one of my uh, soapboxes is that the risk management framework isn't actually a cybersecurity framework. It's an IT security budgeting framework. We have the CSF as a cybersecurity framework. So I feel like we should be doing a lot more with attaching resources to POAMs to say, hey, this thing, happened we knew what was going to happen we just didn't have the money to spend on it our, our poem systems an unfunded requirement yeah. um i implemented tbm in my organization uh in 2017 and we we use a and we have an agile model at the department for managing projects and so my vendors all have bill codes that they use and it's not onerous but I can tell you every penny I've spent on every system since 2017, every single O&M dollar I've spent, all my DM&E money. But the other thing I did was when they started coming out with CISA says binding operational directive, thou shalt. We track that. And my cyber spend within my HR group, this is independent of the rest of the State Department, is now 20% of my annual budget of me complying. Because zero trust is another one of those things that's a gift that keeps on giving, right? That is That hasn't stopped. And we're slowly but surely going through that, but I am tracking my expenses. So whenever there's a supplemental opportunity from our CISO, it says, hey, we have some extra money, I'm ready with a number in my back pocket. And then of course, when I give it to them so quickly, they're like, oh yeah, you pulled that one out of your butt real quickly. It's like, no, I actually can back it up with, with, with money and time. But that's been my strategy because at some point somebody's gonna ask that question, I can show you on paper and then hopefully that'll, that'll maybe make that conversation better. Uh, so to add to that, uh, yes, there are certain systems where the criticality of the system, we do tie to to a POAM. Um, but what happens in practice is that, um, unless some great supplemental comes through, is that you're going to have to rob computer pay Paul to a certain degree. So some other systems then end up suffering. Internally, within a single bureau, for example, if that is the case, then they'll just shuffle money around. But when it's at the department-wide level, then that's where it gets a little more challenging because it's like, what are we not going to be able to do? And then that that recently actually happened where we had to take a huge chunk just to address it because of the criticality. Otherwise, we probably would have been able to explain why the system got hacked or something like that. We have time for one more question, but it's got to be about a minute or less. Anyone have one last question? Audience, come on. Wake up, people. We got one over here. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Tell me who you are first. <laughs> My name is Jim Viazdan from Equinox. Does that mean, does that mean it's either A, B, C, or D? Always multiple choice. Good. Oh, good. Uh, so no, I'm just curious uh, how you're leveraging or accessing AI today. And what I mean by that is, are you doing it uh, commercially, right, through existing commercial capabilities? You had mentioned, sir, leveraging AI-enabled technologies, or are you, um, you know, buying and building your own AI platforms? Or thinking about that, at least. Got to make this a rapid answer, guys, but who wants to take? Both. Yeah, both. Yeah. Well, I, I think let's put a finer point on it. Um, since it's both, would you say the majority is commercial tools that you're bringing in to apply to specific use cases? Or are you thinking more like uh, Microsoft Pilot, just to pick on our friends at Microsoft, a lot of people maybe don't go, oh, that is actually AI. Uh, and, and I'm using that because I have the entire suite, Jerry. So so we just followed up with the budget question. So make the most of the investment that you have, right? Um, and if you can apply it, we're going to try to apply it. Now, it may not be the long-term answer, but it gets us off, you know, the landing pad and gets us going, um, you know, and being a proof of concept or beta, definitely, because, you know, we do have the data 
data issues. We want to make sure, you know, if somebody's asking it, it's putting out the right data. So, you know, we want to watch it for a while um, when we do approach this, but definitely trying to make the most of our investment. And if that can apply first, um, and then when, if money ever comes, <laughs> yeah, there's right. plenty of money. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> you know, then, then we'd probably get a more appropriate solution, but, you know, we're going to make the most of our investments all Tom, take us away. I just want to say our adoption writ large is much more accelerated on the commercial side than the build at your own side because vendors are putting it into products and we're operating to the next version. We're getting it at a much higher rate than we are in, a, you know, autonomous vehicles or things, weapons platforms that we need to build from scratch from the bottoms up, right? Um, now, that technology that we're building kind of bottoms up in large part is much more specialized than sort of chat GPT, right? Things like this. So, um, so we're seeing, we are seeing both. I would say we were not going to vendors and say, Hey, put AI in your product and we'll buy from you. That's generally not our, our MO. Right. Um, but there are things saying like, how can we leverage, um, you know, LIDAR is a good technology from an autonomous vehicle perspective. How do we train on LIDAR data sets, right? We just had a, a, a deep green challenge on that uh, last year. And now we're more into our readiness space, right? How do we predict our readiness using commercial off the chart sort of algorithms, right? Um, when you combine, you know, war fighting training uh, with medical readiness, with just uh, human capital sort of, do we have the actual people themselves? Because recruiting has been an issue, right? Pulling all those different data sets together. So I mentioned about breaking down the silos has been uh, problematic and we're getting after it now, which I'm, I'm excited about as the former chief data officer, right? Um, but uh, that's where I really see that value coming in is taking those tools and applying them against your mission problem set and not worrying about building the A, right? So. Excellent. Thanks, Tom. Thanks to our panelists, and thank you guys for uh, bearing with us this morning. Early. All right. Thanks to Frank as well. Nice job, Frank, as always. Uh, now we're going to do about a 20-minute break. So reminders, please visit the vendors around the room. There's uh, coffee and snacks outside, of course, and be back here for about 1025. We have an emerging technology keynote and then uh, a panel. So come on, people. Let me go ahead. And... Yeah. All right. Let's all get to our seats. We're going to get our emerging tech talk, then we'll get to another panel. So uh, sorry to break up the conversations with the uh, folks around the room, but let's, uh, let's, let's keep the show on the road. All right, coming up next, we have uh, Mike Sanders, the Director of Solutions Expert Team at NetDocuments. Mike was in the hallway, we know. Is, is Mike here? The, hey, there you go. Mike, take it away. Thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And if we can get the slides up there on the screen, then we should be good to go. Fantastic. So I am here to talk about opportunities, challenges, and innovations with generative AI. I work at Net Documents which is a cloud-based legal document management company that happens to be the only one FedRAMP authorized today. And we play all over the world. I've got lots of experience talking to professionals about generative AI, document management, content management, collaboration, so on and so forth, and anything related to that. And as what we're gonna talk about today specifically are things that I have seen from best practices, some challenges to consider when you're looking at implementing AI, inside of what you're trying to do. Now, AI and automation, really what's the value? What do we get out of this? And what we have seen in the industry is it reduces the time to complete a lot of those mundane, repetitive tasks. It increases the quality and knowledge of the work that you and your teams do. And it also enhances the job satisfaction. I mean, let's all face it, AI is a really cool thing to play with, as long as it's accurate as long as we understand the risks and the challenges associated with it. So in looking at AI and automation together, we'll talk a little bit about, well, how does automation come into AI? Is we look at the dividing gap between organizations, stagnant versus thriving. And it really comes down to not just the use of AI and automation, but the effective adoption. So to say we use AI isn't sufficient, but to say we use AI to achieve specific goals, that is the key. 
That's what separates stagnant versus thriving and progressive organizations. Now, as we look at how do we implement, what are some challenges we should consider when bringing generative AI into the mix? <clears throat> Looking, oops, this goes down, doesn't it? Looking at some of the applications out there that have brought AI into what they do. Typically, we see, excuse me, I'm gonna lump them into two categories of AI. Number one, we have AI that uses a chatbot style interface. Number two, we have vendors that have taken AI and have pulled in and done all of the prompt engineering behind the scenes. And so what you are using, we'll call it a black box. Both of them have their advantages. Chatbots, very low adopt or low barrier to entry. People know how to ask questions. The key really becomes, do they know how to ask effective questions? Versus the black box applications. I don't have to know prompt engineering. I don't have to know, as was mentioned earlier, I don't have to know the algorithms for Google. I just type in. I just tell it what I want, and it serves it right back up. So, and I'm not going to go through all of these different types of things, but there are advantages and disadvantages to both. And it all comes down to, it depends on what you're looking to do as to what kind of tool, what kind of AI do you want to bring in to your organization? And I will tell you right now, unless you know the challenges you're going to solve, I'm gonna say, don't even figure out what kind of tool you need. Because if you're getting AI to use AI, and that's it, that's not, there's no quantifiable goal if you know what you're trying to solve. And there's not a single AI tool out there that will do all of it. What we are finding is most organizations today who have defined what they're trying to solve have come up with a hybrid style of AI tools. So many organizations have multiple tools to serve their needs. Now, formulas with AI access or formulas for AI success. There are five specific things that we believe from the documents you should be looking at. And they're all right here. Large language model access, effective prompts, content, what do you use or how do you use it to train or to provide examples? Out of the box value, if your time to value of we're gonna purchase AI, but we're not gonna see value for 10 months versus something that we purchase now and we're gonna see value next week, well, there's a little difference there. And then the ability to customize because not every single organization has the same needs. You might fit into the same bucket, but the output, the format, the what you're looking for is going to be unique to your organization. So without having that ability to customize and tailorize, tailor, tailor, tailor things, it really doesn't give you the advantages that you need. And so looking at this, we look at these five different points. And I'm not gonna run through all of these. There's a lot of stuff here, but what I will highlight is a couple of things for each one of these categories that I feel are things that are very important. So when we look, look at large language model access, being able to find a tool that is model agnostic, many AI tools these days are, are built on OpenAI or they're built on Llama or they're built on so on and so forth. But as you've noticed, as we've all noticed, as we've talked earlier today, AI is changing at a very rapid pace. Being able to take an AI tool and, oh, for this purpose, we're gonna point it here. For this other purpose, we're gonna connect to here. And being able to use large language models that provide you the best advantage to achieve your results is important. From an effective prompt perspective, for me, test and iterate. You look at, okay, we have specific needs in our organization. Here's a tool that comes close, but doesn't quite get it. Being able to test and iterate these prompts and change until you have, this is the prompt that will do exactly what we want it to do, regardless of who's using it. But giving you the ability to do that. 
secure. We all know ChatGPT is not secure. Don't put your confidential data there because the world's going to be able to see it. So ensuring that as you tie into an AI tool, that the data you feed it, the responses you get back is 100% secure, is not shared with anybody. Now you're probably seeing a pattern. Oh, so is the next one we're going to talk about easy to deploy? No. I changed the pattern. Use on day one. That return on investment. When do you get to use it? In production. The faster you can productionize it, the more value you're going to get for the cost of that particular tool. And then finally, the ability to customize. Well, let me change the pattern again. All of them. Being able to take the functionality that is provided and to see how the sausage is made, to be able to change the prompts, change the experience, or even having the ability to create new applications within that tool. So many AI tools in the market are fit for purpose for a couple of use cases. Some, like what NetDocuments does offer, has all these ingredients and gives you the ability, think of it as an AI toolkit. And then we'll go quickly through this. We've talked about chatbots. They're easy to deploy. They're very flexible, but your control and your scalability, as was stated earlier today, standard inputs will give you standard results, but we're human. We're not standard. Someone's going to query one way. Someone else is going to query a different way. So being able to make it scalable, predictable, standard results. We think of the black box where the vendor controls all the functionality, but yes, the experience is easy. The output is standard. Does it fit what you're looking to do? But from a net documents perspective, and our booth is right back there, love to talk to all of you, gives you everything that we talked about today. And so to succeed with AI and automation, these are important factors, at least we believe. And we've put our minds and our resources behind creating something like this that does all of this. So thank you. Well, the hang for two seconds. Yeah. Right. The first uh, then we have the Okay. So what was the question was that I think occurred to me when it was and, and again it has nothing to do with necessary net documents per se. But you said five things which I thought was really good. I wrote them down. LLMs, effective prompts, content, uh, out of box value. And then ability to customize. There's a little bit of a challenge here. There's a paradox, right? Out of the box, but you got to be able to customize. And when we hear software, one of the big things is we want to not customize as much. So maybe help folks if you could just in you know a minute or so, how to find that balance? Because I want out of the box, but I want to customize. Uh oh. Yeah. No, you're exactly right, and it's and part of this is the ability to modular modularize concepts and tools and what I'll call apps. So all of a sudden, out of the box, day one, oh, we can do these 10 things. But you know what? We have these 30 others. We'd love to take one of these things, copy it over. So it's still out of the box, untouched. People still use it. But now with this copy, we can customize. We can tailor because we have this other scenario that's similar, but we want different output. We want a different experience. We want a different whatever. And so giving you and your teams and your groups and your departments the ability to do that without affecting what's out of the box and always having that starting point of oh crap we screwed up well who tests in production nobody hopefully keeping that in production and making copies and then customizing the copies is the power of that all right very good all right let's thank uh, mike sanders from uh, net documents thank you mike <laughs> all right uh, uh coming up next we have one more emerging tech uh discussion and uh, is chris here there's chris, there's chris there you go and uh, let's let's do this together. Kuoka, Kwaka. All right, there you go. Chris from Kwa and and your Gogel. 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 Look at that. So <laughs> so many challenges. All right, Chris, take it away. All right, thank you. Uh, you know, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the devices that many of you are using right now as I speak. Uh, the phone in your pocket. Uh, so, what we're going to focus on today is the same types of issues that I've seen as I've 
you know, gotten into this industry in mobile security uh, back in 20, 2013, 2014, when I graduated with a cybersecurity degree. Um, unfortunately, due to the lack of attention on mobile versus your traditional enterprise network, your cloud, other things that you have budgeted for, um, these threats, you know, have continued to evolve without even being addressed in the basic form. So we'll focus today on some of those, those threats. I'll show you some real examples, uh, some apps you may have installed on your phone today, um, and hopefully get you to you know, pay more attention and help spread the awareness when you're downloading, looking at the app store, you know, choosing what's installed on your phone um, in personal and work life uh, and prioritizing uh, security. So if we can get the slide deck going. Thank you. Um, so if we skip ahead to a few slides, we have our first type of threat. So this is, you know, the very basic thing that came out as soon as, you know, the iPhone released, as soon as your Android phone released back in 2011, 2012, just simply harvest your data. So what's a lot easier than trying to break into an enterprise network, you know, find an exploit zero day, get onto the router, you know, pivot to the server, have persistence, get access to the data and then export it? Well, just ask the user if you can have it. And most of the time they'll give it to you. So we'll take a look at some examples of, uh, you know, in the app store today that are still doing this, but you know, what's the benefit here? You know, it's legal, you're not breaking any rules. It's easy, you know, there's not very complex, you know, attacks, hacks you have to do. You just have to make something useful um, and potential for mass data collection. So we're not talking about, you know, the 10,000 people at your agency, 100,000 people at your agency, the million people that work for the government, we're talking about billions of people that you're able to collect data from uh, through this methodology. And then of course, what makes those uh, advanced attacks easier? Um, when you know those people in that agency, that you know those people, uh, uh, what they're doing, who they talk to, you know, what they like, you have all that information about them, it becomes a lot easier to then spear fish and get inside that agency through through some uh, human uh, you know, networking there. So how do we detect these? The next slide, please, is the, uh, you know, we simply have to watch them. So you see that high powered NH or NFL camera on the left-hand side, um, you know, when these applications are actually running on your phone, after you download it, you hit yes, accept, you can have my contact data, you can have my text message data, whatever it is. What do they actually do with that data? You would think, you know, the app store providers are focusing on this, but it, you know, simply they're, they're trying to get more apps in the store because they make billions of dollars every time you download, get served an ad, pay for an up, upsell in the application. So what you need to do is automate the uh, discovery of what these applications are doing on your phone. So we'll skip ahead to the next slide, please, uh, for the next type of threat. So privileged and backdoor applications and SDKs. Um, when we're looking at a more advanced attack method, what's you know another approach you can take? Well, you can get inserted at the supply chain. So my device, your device, most of the devices in our household are all manufactured in the same place. Uh, we all know where that is. And we've seen over time, things are snuck in either accidentally or purposefully, don't know, uh, but they are able to then collect at a lower level on your devices the data that you use and handle on your phone. So some advantages here, you know, you can get complete compromise. You're not talking about getting data from one app. You're talking about getting all the data on your phone because you're at a lower level uh, on the device. You have persistence there. You know, you're not getting replaced with updates or anything like that. You're already in the, the base hardware. And of course, you're hard to detect because you're operating at a lower level than what the operating system providers can protect. So when you download an app from the store, it can ask you for that permission. You have to hit yes or no. If I'm installed at the base level on the phone, when you get it out of the box, Google's software on top of that has no control over me. I can subvert that and get access to your information at a lower level. So on the next slide, we'll show you uh, an example of that on the right-hand side. Back in 2016, we found the number one phone on Amazon at the time, a uh, $50 phone manufactured by a company based in Florida in the US. And every 72 hours, it would extract your text messages, your GPS coordinates for that, those last four days, uh, and extract that information back to China. And 
So what this was doing, it was collecting this information, but also having a remote command and control capability. So they could perform searches for specific names, addresses, whatever it might be on your device. If they found it interesting, they could add more capabilities to it. So expand that footprint, expand that collection capabilities on the device. And this wasn't hiding out there. You know, this is millions of people using a phone branded with Amazon's own brand, sold in the US by a US manufacturer, or US distribution network. But the critical piece was the supply chain. The device was manufactured in a place where untrusted things can happen. So how do we find more of these things? Well, we have a capability here uh, to do uh, flow-based vulnerability scanning. And this is you know, a technical thing. We can dive into more detail uh, later if you want. But essentially what it does is it looks at the giant code graph, you know, everything that can happen on that device and identifies interesting things. You know, it collects your SMS data and then it reaches the network here. And that can raise a flag to then inspect it and, and find things like this. And to this day, we've got about three, or sorry, 275 different CVEs discovered and produced with this. So this is not something that's just on paper, you know, that you can leverage, but it's something that's out there being used to find things like this to this day. So we'll dive into some specific examples here. And I wanna see some hand raises on the next slide if you've got this application on your device today. So this is something that you may use at a conference like this, when you get a business card to digitize it. And you might download it, install it, because below the paid ad, it's the number one recommended app for this purpose on the App Store. Uh, Cam Scanner, it's got 1.3 million ratings, five stars. As an average end user, this is, you don't even have to look. You know, this is the recommended app. It's got a million users, you know, whoever, however you know, many people have used it. It's got a five-star rating. I'm gonna install it and use it right now. Well, if we skip over to the next slide, we'll take another look at this app, but from a tooling perspective. Oh, shoot, you know, 100 threat score, hard-coded key, uh, communicates with high-risk location. Uh, maybe I should take a deeper look. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at what actually happens when this app, app is running on your phone, we get that, that flag at the top communicates with high-risk locations. And we can see on the map, 383 connections in China, 18 in Hong Kong. And we can see on the right-hand side there, the some of the, the redacted list of connections that it's making. So as you're installing and using this application and you hit, yes, access my camera, well, where's your data going? Right here. Uh, next slide, please. And you might be comforted because it's on the App Store. They have rules about what they can do with your data. So you go check the privacy policy. Maybe it doesn't actually collect my data. Well, what data do we collect? User-generated content. When you use our services to scan documents or images, we will collect the documents or images which you choose to take or upload. So it's out there, open, sitting on the App Store, number one recommended app, and it's telling you it's doing all this, but people don't look. You have to actually take a deeper look and find what these applications are doing. So on the next slide, if you just simply even Google the company, well, it's pretty clear where they're located. <laughs> so, you know, these types of things, you know, these harvesting applications that are out there, they don't have to hide from you because it's just, you know, kind of default. You trust what's in the store. You know, you trust it's got good ratings. You trust Apple or Google that they've done their job to protect you. But as a government user, government agency, you especially have to pay attention to where your data is going and what's happening to it when you use those applications. So, you know, by, by the way, the two other apps they, they offer on the store, Cam Scanner for business cards, uh, Cam Scanner for Salesforce. <laughs> so can you imagine a better way to collect data about a social network of people who are talking to each other, who know each other, you know, what their contact information is? than just to ask them for that data yourself. Uh, so uh, hopefully you know, take a second look at whatever you're downloading on your store. So this is an example of potentially a bad app behaving badly. We'll quickly cover another example of a good app behaving badly on the next slide. So I've been talking to a few people yesterday at the reception around the, around the event. And you know, a lot of people have similar stories of you know, a coworker, a family member, someone that gets 
you know, phishing attack to get their bank account, you know, drained. So they'll get a text message, email, phone call, whatever it might be. So you may want to install an app to help protect you from that. We have an example here, caller ID, phone block, you know, 10 million downloads, 4.3 rating. Uh, so this might help me actually protect myself from those phishing attacks. Next slide, please. Oh, crap. Another 100 rating? You know, what happened here? Uh, if we look at the, the next slide, we'll see not only does it access that, that sensitive data, the SMS messages, the phone calls. Well, of course it does because it needs that data to protect me. But we also see application programmatically leaks data. Uh, so we should take a deeper look at that. Next slide, please. So we see on the left-hand side some of the technical output showing that when the SMS is received by the code, it programmatically logs that SMS, meaning it's taking data from a safe, secure place on the phone, putting it to an insecure place. So and this is not you know, something that was likely intentional. It might be just a flaw left in from development, whatever it might be. But it's a good app trying to do good things, but actually making you more insecure in the process. Uh, so we can see on the bottom even an example from our black box test where a message that we, we sent to the device is logged in that file. So you can not only see it in the code, but you can see it at runtime actively happening on the phone. So next slide, we can take a quick look at some of the things that we can do to help address this problem. So as an agency, you likely have an MDM, Intune, uh, Ivanti Mobile Iron, uh, Workspace One, whatever it might be. If you find one of these applications, you can ban it. Don't let your users install it. Uh, so your cam scanner app, that might be a first one to get added to that ban list. Um, you can update your network defense. You likely already have a VPN firewall in place. Take those IP addresses, take those domain names, add them to that list to make sure they don't get hit from the device. And you know, my primary recommendation here, and hopefully you can take this on, is to warn the users. If people aren't aware of these types of risks, they're not gonna look for them and they're not gonna you know, be aware that they have you know, application on their device, potentially they're looking to install, that's simply just stealing their data from them out in the world, you know, blatantly. And of course, you can always report to the vendor. You know, if they're a US-based manufacturer, US-based company, they'll likely address the problem. But the key for the, you know, the government is there has to be some dedicated attention and budget toward this issue, because in our work with the US government this year, we found even in US government developed applications, three different instances of Russian or Chinese connections inside the government's own apps that they're pushing out. And that's because the supply chain, not only for the devices, but for the application code base, where developers are pulling things from the online stores, pulling their things from the Maven repositories, other places to build their application. Well, guess what? those attackers can insert themselves in that process too. So thanks for your time today and happy to answer any questions. Great. All right, this famous last words. Perfect, <laughs> you can't have the mic. All right, well, <laughs> since uh, I've got the most handsome mic stand here, but <laughs> So great, uh, if I got MDM, I, I can check on my government issued device. We're getting more and more things or, uh, where they're running a container on their personal device and that's how they're accessing government resources. How do I enable um, my executives, my users or whatever to say like, oh, you've got stupid stuff on your own device. Um, Cause it's not the government container, it's the bigger device there. So is there a path forward? Yeah, I think there is. I mean, just like I said, that that first action of letting people know that these risks are out there, because if they don't know that there's applications out there doing this, th these things, they're not going to care about their work device. When they go on their personal side, they're not going to you know, pay attention to it. So the first thing is always awareness uh, for sure. Uh, but then, of course, even on that containerized side of your device, there may be some vendor that made a mistake, you know, included some code and it's leaking it directly from that container too. So I'd say, you know, pay attention to that container especially, but, you know, awareness is the first step before um, you can get to uh, resolution. 
And then uh, we're going to go right into the next panel. So Chris will be around hopefully for a minute or two or the rest of the day. You can yep. talk to him separately. Uh, so panelists, my panel, let's go. I don't do intros. Let's go to stage. All right. Yeah. There, there they are. Those are the people on the panel. That's the intro you get. We're missing. There's Tony. All right. Tony, I thought you were still meandering. I was worried. All right. So in case of, uh, you got me up. All right. So uh, uh, a little, little trivia to get us going because the, the audience questions have been good, but you seem a little like, you know, we got mid-morning coffee. Well, we'll, we'll maybe a little tired and and we have the title of the panel is you can see smart governance navigating the AI frontier in government work. It's pretty broad. So we're going to do kind of a broad trivia. And this was mentioned earlier on, on Frank Kunkel's panel. So um, kind of it's a nice follow on. So here's your first question. Audience participation, call out the answers, right? So um, as of September 1st, and I actually just checked this the other day, it has not been updated. But so as of September 1st, how many AI use cases were there in the federal inventory? How many AI use cases in the federal inventory? Give me a number. How many? I lost. You cheated. She, she's banned from answering my questions. Uh, the answer is 710. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, and Natalie, I'll go one step further. Who has the most? Which agency has the most? VA. Uh, I didn't have them as one of the most. Homeland? Homeland has only 41, according to the inventory. Uh, Energy Department has 177, and uh, HHS 156. So just give you some, some examples. All right, last one. Um, again, we're looking at data that, that comes from uh, 2020 to 2022. So it's a little old, but that's the most recent one that you can find. So how much money did agencies spend on AI tools and technologies in that two-year period? We're looking for a number. How much money? Exactly. <laughs> Well, someone tried to guess. So one of the really smart market research firms tried to guess. So any, give me a number, a dollar. No, keep going. Nobody has, this is audience participation. This is not voting well for later on. 100 million, too little. Thank you, Greg. All right, $7.7 .7 billion was the estimated amount of money spent on AI from 2020 to 2022, according to Dell Tech market research firm. That's a 36% increase over the last three years. Now, to be clear, they say it does not include funding in embedded systems with AI, such as the DHS Insider Threat Infrastructure or VA's health and data analytics platform. So they make very clear on that. All right, well, we're, we will warm you all up. I promise we will get you going. Uh, so here's how we do panels when I like to moderate. Uh, first, we're unplanned or unrehearsed. We don't... I, they say, what questions are you going to ask? I say, I don't ask questions. They're going to take three to five minutes and tell you something you don't know about the work they're doing in this world. Uh, something around AI, something to help kind of get the workforce ready for it. Uh, and then we, I will ask my one follow-up, and then we will get back to you and ask questions. So a little bit of warm-up. I'm letting you know you're going to be on the spot to ask questions. Remember, I'm a reporter. I can ask questions all day. they much rather hear from you. So again, unplanned, unrehearsed. So, uh, Tammy, you're right here next to me. Tammy, from Richmond, Federal Reserve Bank. Take it away. So it's hard to... Bill Turner. So it's hard to beat Jason's uh, energy. So excuse me. <laughs> so um, I am the CISO for the Federal Reserve, so it's a little bit of a different perspective here. But oddly enough, my best friend in all of this is our Chief Innovation Officer, which that's not a normal pairing. Um, but really, we think about AI like we think about almost any emerging technology. And we really follow a framework we call the four E's. It starts out with education. We all need to get smarter about it. Then we go to enablement. And really what we're thinking is, what are the guardrails? Not the barriers, not the obstacles, but what are the guardrails? Then we go to experimentation. And really there, that's where we're asking people to bring forth use cases. So we're not using technology for technology's sake. And after we get through experimentation, 
that's when we go to execution. How do we take what we're doing and put it into practice so we can use it for business value? So this is the format that we use at the Federal Reserve right now. We haven't gotten to the execution phase. Education continues all along, along with the enablement. Uh, and we're doing a lot of experimentation right now. Um, so that's kind of where we are in the process and maybe that'll kick this off. Well, I have, I have my follow-up, so don't go anywhere. Get that mic back. Um, interesting, I, I love the three E's. It's easy for us to remember. Um, and, and in the last panel, one thing we heard was a lot of education. And I, it fascinates me how that education. So do you mind just kind of delving into that a little bit further? What does education look like at the Federal Reserve? How do you get IT people, non-IT people to say, oh, I understand what, 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 what's the art of possible? Yeah, so one of the things that I would say is you really need to democratize your education. Um, and especially when you're talking about technology, because um, I thought it was really interesting what Alexis said, that the people who were better at um, creating prompts were not the engineers and the developers and so on and so forth. And the reason we think it's important to democratize education is really around the fact is you got to put the education to be consumable to the people in the business so that they can start to put forward potential business cases. So there was a few things that uh, we did. So we started out with just some very basic education. What is it? How could it be used? Um, just basically breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. And then from there, what we did is we, um, and by the way, we invited anybody, literally 23,000 people at the Federal Reserve. It didn't matter who you were, you could be an executive assistant or you could be a data scientist. All of them were welcomed. The next thing we did is we thought about education in blocks of um, expertise. So we did have an education session around um, security and risk. That was, everybody was still invited, but it kind of blocked it up for people. We had some education sessions around um, using it for code generation and how that might look like. So that's a couple of ways for you to think about it. Obviously there's education out there available to folks who have deep expertise um, and knowledge requirements, but it's a way to think about education in your organization broadly and you'll be amazed at how many people will show up. All right, that was my next question. Don't go on. I have to ask the follow-up. Did you get non-IT people at some of these? Absolutely. And what was what was the, were they like, thank you so much, or why did you make me do this, or somewhere in between? No, actually, what we got was, please do more. Okay. Omar, from uh, Ginny May. Ginny May. Ginny May is a, a corporation owned by HUD, and our mission is housing. Uh, we are the engine that bring fund to to uh, support uh, our affordable housing and also building our hospitals and school. Uh, what I do for them, I I am a director for emerging technology and innovation lab. So I run their lab where it's it is a safe zone to test this new technology. AI is among them, so uh, it's uh, it becomes very simple for us especially the last week in terms of our marching orders and what we need to do with AI. I think it's very clear for the government what we need to do because the executive order has been published, has been announced and sent to us and we are reacting to it. So we HUD has uh, nominated their AI officer who we're gonna be using to start asking questions and also supply us with further guidance or any update. So that's, we met with, with him a couple of times. So he's in the works. We are also looking at the executive order and looking at all the criteria you want us to adhere to and comply. Some of them are very clear and we have been doing. Some are new and we need to know how we can measure ourselves to satisfy the government's requirements. Uh, in terms of uh, the use cases, we have also, as you know, use cases in AI are different. Before, in the lab, the use cases are published within just the lab. Now they have to, to be published for the whole United States state to see. So, and we need to document them properly 
and we need to make sure that they align with the mission and they are properly funded. So I am working on some use cases. I'm going to share with you because for me, I am not looking for AI product or technology. I'm looking for solutions that are powered by, by AI. So if there is something along the, you know, the line of the housing or the financials and, you know, analysis in terms of risk, in terms of uh, managing what the government are required us to do. This is definitely uh, of interest to us. Uh, there was a question about how do you guys work with the industry and also with the government agencies? Because definitely I look forward to working with government agency in terms of collaboration, in terms of understanding their lesson learned and how they bring things to us so we can save taxpayers money. Uh, I am establishing uh, a dialogue in a platform and it's going to be at innovation.genimate.gov. So you guys can go there and register and collaborate with us, especially if you are in the housing and the financial and insurance, you know, counterparty risk assessment. These are things. And also cybersecurity and AI. I have committed to my CISO to bring in a use case to them. So that's, that's an area. Also, if you want to email me uh, at innovation at hud.gov, so just innovation at how that go. It will come to me to, to the lab, to my team. Uh, so these are the things that the lab is doing. And there was, I mean, it's not a big surprise, the executive order to me. I mean, mainly because I was one of the five government folks that answered the RFI from the White House. So I feel a bit guilty, but I believe that they have really gave, gave us a good set of guidelines. So really look forward to working with that. And I think it's gonna be a living document. It's not gonna be something that uh, is set in stone. I don't think so. I think it's gonna evolve. That's why this smart governance is very important to us. And what we mean by smart governance, we can control the AI uh, application that we develop in the lab. We can produce all the requirements in terms of trustworthiness, in terms of traceability, explainability, the whole thing. What worries me is the application that's coming from the industry to us to adapt and they have embedded AI. Those are where we need help in terms of how do we govern? And also don't forget government, we have ATO and that's a big word for us. So for us to secure an ATO, there is a lot of check mark we need to, to make sure that we complete. And also O&M, how, how do we maintain it? These are important questions that we need to articulate to the government. I need to make sure that I act as a technical advisor to our implementation folks, our project manager and say, this is a sure thing. We can spend taxpayers money here in good conscience and there is no problem. So for me, these are, these are important things that I want the industry to help us with. Now, cognitive governance and smart governance. Cognitive governance, I gave a talk about three years ago to the data forum where I say, this is something we need to start doing. We cannot just bring a bunch of folks to sit and look at a bunch of documentation and opine on it. We need engines that conduct governance business and help us with insights. I don't think they are there, but if they are there, please let me know. Because I believe we have a risk in the management and governance of AI. I don't think we have the tools. I don't think we have the SME, and I, be, I agree with education, but I don't think education is enough. I think it's gonna make us aware of what to uh, expect and anticipate, but we need some engines that are not biased, that can support our due diligence in making sure we don't introduce any disruption, we don't in the, introduce any risk, and that we can keep the government operation running as expected. And especially for us, we are at the center of a financial operation of housing. So for us, anything we do needs to be well vetted and the risk mitigated. And we have clear management of what we need to do. So it cannot be any black box confusion using chat GPT personal, I don't think be mine. For me, that's a big question. We're seeing things, you know, especially when it comes to, to policy, we need to make sure that things is, is in control. 
So for us, in terms of AI, RAG, you know, it's 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 definitely an option for me. I am gonna bring it to the lab. Chat GPT will never make it to the lab. I was like, oh, bring what? I think I can. I am. I use Chat GPT personal, but to bring it to the business, I think that's a, that's a different story altogether. So these are, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope you know maybe we have new version of Chat GPT that the government can adapt. But uh, for us, in terms of our operation, in terms of what we need to do for our agency, uh, I don't think things that is out there can be used uh, to run our operations. So these are things that is in the lab, and I hope that you guys can help us with the smart governance, the cognitive governance, so solution in housing, solution, uh, how to increase affordability, house, affordable housing how to eradicate homelessness. These are things we definitely will support. We'll bring you to the leadership of, of HUD and Jenny May. I'm here to play a coordination role for my agency. You know, I do lead a couple of implementations. We are big on low code, no code. We're big on AI adoption, machine learning. We have two use cases in production and which I think the AI officer was like surprised. But those are controlled uh, implementation. They are like, long impact, you know, one in, in the NLG space, which I have done personally for the agency. And the NLG, you create the matrix, you create the measures, you, you create the narratives, and you just the logic that uh, the engine helps you with. And we did a small machine learning implementation that helps with the data quality anomalies that we face in some field. Uh, but the, those are small, but we don't have AI or one in the operation. I, this is, this is the things we need to answer for the government of what we need to do to do such implementation. And I hope that this helps. And I am here today if there is any clarification needed from the industry or from my government uh, colleagues. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. All right, don't put it down, don't put it down. No, no, don't no. put it down. I have Again? A follow Gotta have a follow-up. Okay. All right, Omar, um, you talked a lot about the governance side and you talked about how as a chief AI officer, you're working with them. What's maybe if you, you know, what's one or two things from, from Jeannie May's perspective or HUD more broadly, what's the hard thing on governance that you're, you're tackling? Like what's in front of you in the next six months or next year that you say, okay, here's how we have to tackle on governance. Does anything come to mind? Yeah, I hope this, this will help uh, the industry and some uh, government agency. Like what are the use cases that we have at the lab? Like what are you looking at? And we're not looking at everything because I need to scope what we do because of the taxpayers' money, and we need to be good steward of taxpayers' money. So I need to be very judicious in terms of what I need to present. So there is a use case for counterparty risk assessment using AI. So that's big on the list. Uh, the second one is what I will call the AI agent. The AI agent, it's like a smart chatbot that help our account exec manage the, the portfolio. So that's another one. And then cybersecurity and AI. That's an, so for me, governance is making sure that this implementation that we have, have low risk or no risk, manageable, can have an ATO, and we can guarantee on it. All right, Hope that enough. helps. Yep, definitely. All right, uh, Suman from the US Copyright Office. Hi, good morning, everybody. I hope it's morning. Um, good afternoon. Uh, this is Suman Shukla, um, section head for the data management team from Library of Congress Copyright Office. We're talking about AI, which is full on all about data. And Library of Congress is the biggest repository of copyright data. So you can see I'm sitting and, and data is new gold today. So you can see I'm sitting on a gold mine today. And we have a lot of things to do with the data exploring governance, management, everything. So I have successfully started a data management program that uh, addresses the most part, the, the you know, various parts of data management, like data governance, data quality, uh, data architecture, um, doing with the business intelligence and data warehousing, as well as um, digital asset management. We have 43 million card records sitting in drawers with valuable data that needs to be digitized. We successfully digitized, put it online so people can access from remotely from their home instead of coming to the building and physically pulling through the drawers. We still have 
uh, millions of volumes of record books that's currently being digitized using OCR technology. Um, there's a lot of handwritten data, which is the biggest challenge for us currently that, that uh, requires a lot of human intervention. Uh, OCR doesn't help. Uh, we need some kind of a large language processing models or uh, you know, some kind of uh, technology that can extract data uh, that, that can look into a human uh, handwritings done very, uh, over a period of time with different policy and procedures. So you know, lots of challenges there. Um, th there's a lot of uh, need of data literacy. So I started a BI working group that addresses not only the challenges regarding the data governance, the data quality, as well as looking into the data we have, it also helps teach the, the staff and the users what, what data means to them, what kind of data is there, what sources we are pulling those data sets are from. The legacy applications never explored before, volume of data sitting there. People didn't even knew that, oh, we have the data. Actually, we can use them, and we can use them sensibly to make fact-based uh, decision-making. So we expose those databases, those data sets to the general copyright uh, staff to see, hey, look, these are the data sets. Not only exposing the data, also exposing the data quality issues in there, the disparity in how the data is named in different systems. We call about silos. We have cylinder of excellence, valuable information, you know, plethora of uh, data sets, but they're called different names in different applications. And people are talking about same thing, but they are thinking they are addressing different issues. So standardization of data across the board. Um, I just set up a, a data governance board so we can address those data quality issues and have a standardized approach across the copyright office, how the data can be used, how it can be named, how it can be mapped from one application to another, the whole source to target mapping, creating a data dictionary and a data glossary. So, you know, people can have a reference of documentation. They can look into what exactly if one person says something, another means the same thing. They derive the same information. They're not talking two different languages. So a very important part was standardization. Obviously documentation, you know, when we look at the legacy systems, we had hard time doing reverse engineering, understanding what the application means and where the data sits and how it is mapped to each other. The, you know, there has been a very hard time finding any documentation for any of those legacy system applications, which was done way back when, and you know, people left and we don't know there's a transition. So very important part for us was documentation. And then data literacy, you know, data is nothing if people don't know what it is, where it's coming from and what's happening there. So we started a data literacy program to make sure people understand what copyright data means to them, how they can use it. And, and then having a single source of truth created a data warehouse, a data lake kind of structure. So we feed data from multiple sources clean it, make it usable, and, and present it to the user so they understand, they, they get the right information, you know, garbage in, garbage out, the key factor for AI or data or any other system. So make sure, you know, we, we cleanse the data. We have the quality data to be used, which is key part for uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, multiple, you know, we are, we are uh, tackling the golden triangle, people process technology in parallel. We're not just looking at what technology we have, what system we have, what's the as a system, what's, what, where we want to be, what will be the to be application or, or environment we are going to, but also what processes we are following, what are the redundancies we can reduce, what are the uh, uh, things that we can streamline, what processes can be eliminated, like, you know, we cannot hone on everything there, we have to let go some things that are not so useful, or, you know, uh, least needed. People definitely, a change management, a mindset, you know, the cultural shift from, oh, I'm used to doing this thing in a certain way, um, you know, it's good for me, I'm not changing, I'm not learning new things, or, you know, is it going to eliminate my position or my job? Like when I implemented a business intelligence tool that has an associative engine in it, and it does lots of AI working, actually it pulls the data, generates an, a, a report and dashboard on its own based on what information feeds, is fed into it. And people are like, oh no, 
I take 20 spreadsheets. It take me two months to compile all the data and generate the report so we can give it to the management or give it to uh, um, Congress. So if you're going to take just 30 minutes to generate the data, what I'm going to do in the rest of the time, hey, you're free to do more other quality works. It's not taking your job. So getting people out of from that cultural shift, educating them the meaning of AI or meaning of the data or meaning of the shifting the paradigm from old school thought to the new school. We have been working a lot in those directions. And the biggest threat for us right now is generative AI for copyright. Anything that is copyrighted has to have a human authorship. If it's not human authorship, if it's not a contribution of a human person, it's not copyrightable. And with the generative AI and the deep fakes, by the way, the picture of mine over there is a deep fake, deep fake generation of my picture. Just kidding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so all the deep fakes happening and you know, generation of new uh, creative works, it takes toll on us. We need to find out they're creating how do we discriminate? It's not a gen AI product. It's a human product. So we have to be on the top of the game. So we started listening sessions. Uh, you know, feel free to go on copyright.gov. And if you want to participate in those and you want to provide your feedback about how uh, copyright should be done or, you know, what your ideas about gen AI is, we have multiple listening sessions regarding literary works, performing arts, and, you know, all other areas of creative works. So we listen to the customers the voice of customer is very important. So we understand what they are expecting for, uh, from us. And that's how we derive how we should be moving forward. Uh, we also have internal working groups, data working group, uh, um, AI working groups to understand internally what, how we want to do. It's not just the policy. Policy is, you know, is a governance. It's, it, it should be as what, how uh, AI is applicable to our world. It's not a cookie cutter solution for everybody. Within an agency too, every division has a different need, a different level of AI needed. So we, we get that kind of feedback from the users internally and externally. And then, you know, we try to create something or, or have our policy and governance uh, follow that process. So, you know, all I can say is we are in a boat creating a GPS to navigate AI to reach the Gen AI destination. A uh, quick follow-up. I want to go back to something you said maybe in the early part of your, your uh, conversation, you mentioned data governance boards, standardized approaches, creating data dictionaries, glossaries. It's a little surprising that the, the Library of Congress Copyright Office didn't already do this, or had you done it, but it's things have changed so much that you have to take a half or a full step back and say, how does it need to change? How do we continue to evolve? Talk a little bit about that data governance board piece, because again, I, I would, everything you do is data. I mean, yeah, yeah. So it wasn't there before. Six years back, I joined library, and that was the budding stages of talking about how we should establish a data management initiative and have a data governance policy and things like that. So when I joined, it was pretty much a, a, a blank page, and I get to you know work with that and provide my expertise and set up the whole initiative there. And I, I discovered that there is a lot of data, there is a lot of work that can be done with that data, but never explored before. So we started talking about, let's see, what do we have as is? So we created an uh, uh, enterprise. We looked at all the legacy systems and, and explored the databases and looked what kind of data we have and how it can be used, how it can be leveraged and we created an enterprise data model by mapping all those legacy system databases, creating a source to target mapping, how the interdependency of all the databases and systems to each other, the risk, the vulnerabilities, and the uses. And, and that's when we started establishing. Right now, I can say my team is the trailblazer in Library of Congress, establishing the whole data management initiative and, and, and really doing a good job on that. All right, and there's plenty more questions. Uh, Greg from Pure Storage, uh, let's get the industry perspective of the smart governance AI world we're all in. Yep. I feel obligated to use Jason's mic and contribute here. So, so we look at and talk to a lot of customers, especially in leadership positions, going back 12 months, 24 months, and so, you know, what is your long-term strategy with generative AI? It was the hot topic 12 months ago, and the answer was yes, yes, yes and all. Give me all, yes to all. And what we're finding is that about half of those folks have already gone on the path have failed. And why is that? Cost got out of control. There wasn't a clear scope. A lot of the things you folks talked about. What is the objective? 
Generative AI or AI is not the target, right? That is the mechanism to get to the outcome you want for your organization or business. So at the end of the day, what it came down to was a very simple process, right? So right now in 2023, going into 2024, a lot of customers and, and companies were in sort of like a inquiry stage, like trying to figure out what they want to be, what they're targeting, where they want to go. Some folks have already rolled into the implementation stage. Uh, and some folks are actually into what I call the the iterate stage. Hey, how do I make it better, stronger, faster? How do I develop this model? How do I get more applicability across my entire enterprise? So when I look at it from that lens, it's really fascinating to see if those that don't take that approach, you're going to get left behind, right? The crazy statistic that just still <laughs> gets me every time is 90% of the known data we have was generated in the last 24 months. That's 60X going back to what was generated in 2010. It's an absurd amount of data. Now it didn't just appear out of nowhere because now we have it more, more readily accessible, more readily to use. But most importantly is when we start looking through the lens of AI and where can I really be impactful? The top three places we've seen the industry across enterprise, government, any, all verticals really, is um, customer experience, uh, cost optimization, number one, uh, number two, customer experience, and number three, growth potential. Right, again, that's more business enterprise focus. But at the end of the day, this is just the tip of the iceberg, folks. We're very, very early on into this. And what we're finding is folks that have planned for the long-term goal of, hey, hey, I'm gonna establish my four layers of my um, AI infrastructure. I'm gonna start with infrastructure, then my models, then the tools, and the, ultimately the application, instead of just slapping on uh, you know, a, a COTS AI, if you will, and saying, yep, we're, we're AI ready. It just doesn't work that way. It's gonna end poorly. Cost is gonna be a huge concern. And ultimately, you're going to have no outcomes uh, for what you're looking to do. And speaking of, you know, costs and getting down that path, you know, think about infrastructure costs. Right? We kind of take it for granted. It, it's, you know, yeah, it is what it is. We have we have stuff in the data center. We have stuff on the cloud. Absolutely, but the amount of resources required. I mean, customers and agencies can't go down and do it just to prove a concept does anything anymore. There has to be purpose and reason behind it because the cost for these POCs are exponential as well. And that's where we're working along with customers saying, hey, how can we help right size some of this? How can we look at more energy efficient options? And ultimately say, long term, what are you trying to do here? Here's how we're going to help you get there because storage is ultimately a huge part of that. You make, bring up a really interesting point is, is how do we help you get there, right? What do you want to do? How often when you ask that question, do customers come back or potential customers come back and say, use AI, <laughs> right? Like, like. Do they, or, or do they have a pretty good, like, we want to make this process better. And, and then you have to, okay, there's other questions. There's one thing we heard from this morning is, is you have to ask the right prompts. We heard that just in the emerging tech talk. We heard this this morning from Alexis. Or is, it, is it the, I don't know what I don't know to ask? Give me a sense. 100%. So the, you can also gauge where the, the customer agency is when you hear that first response back. Is it, um, I don't know, what, what do you think kind of what response? And you say, hey, okay, how can we help down the path? What are you trying to achieve? What are your larger goals for the agency over the years? Have you thought about applying those models? In some cases, it's like, oh yeah, we, we have four or five tests going on right now. We're looking at cost optimization. We're looking at uh, engineering integration, AI ops, things like that, entering from a larger IT stack. So it's very fascinating where folks are on the spectrum with AI when it comes to the technology stack. What was also more fascinating is something us folks in IT, and I'm saying this as a, a certified propeller head here that was down in data centers for years and years. I mean, 40% of folks that are responsible for AI aren't in IT. It's not. It's outside of the traditional technology stack. So that's another thing. Not only do we have to make sure we're asking the right prompt, we have to make sure we're asking the right folks the right prompt as well. Okay. Uh, Tony from VA. Now, after Tony, we're going to go to the audience questions to start thinking, but don't not pay attention to Tony either. Do what you want. I mean, free do what you want. It's just fine. Um, okay, so I want to put some like shots on target. The prompt is navigating the AI frontier of AI and government work. How do we do that? I, I suggest that the, the most important thing is that we should do it together. Um, and, and I don't just mean the Kumbaya way. I, I also mean like truly collaborate, not just within and across your agencies, but uh, with interagency. Cooperation and private uh, private public uh, cooperation is, is I think going to be extremely important. And I think that's particularly important at two levels. The first one is at the policy level. I know there was some poo pooing on policy earlier in the day, but um, I'm going to try to defend policy for a minute. And then also when it comes to education, because there's a, there's one thing to educate, but then there is something else to educate consistently. So why policy, right? So uh, I, I take policy crosswalk and interconnectivity extremely seriously. 
I had the honor to briefly work for NASA, working on their trustworthy AI policy. And one of the things that I tried to make sure to do was to make sure that that, that policy was as crosswalked as possible with other agencies or international partners with which NASA might want to cooperate. And the reason being is when you have a policy, generally you're espousing in that policy some form of base rule or base standard that you're implying to others with which you work that might declare a thing as approved by a policy to be X. So trustworthy AI policy is a big deal these days, right? If I have a trustworthy AI policy and I have an AI that I'm saying is trustworthy, that might mean nothing to you if my trustworthy AI policy doesn't comport with yours or we don't have some form of established crosswalk amongst our policies. And that somewhat breaks down the ability for us to navigate the future together because I might have to do extra checks to see, well, what does it mean when you say trustworthy? What did you check? What did you ask? What did you do? Well, ah, that is not good enough for me. And there, there, there could be a breakdown and a delay in innovation and a breakdown and delay in government work or, or in the general advancement of the country because we have to go back and recheck and re-ask questions and re vet something that we've had to had done historically, particularly as a federated system where there is gaps among states and things. But I think that we can do better, particularly with the data available and the technology available now, it definitely lowers the workload to take a comparative assessment of the policies that we lay down to try to find some form of base standard so that when one agency says AI is trustworthy or when one company says an AI is trustworthy, the rest of us can understand what that means. And hopefully in an ideal world, that would our policy would mean the same thing. When you say it means trustworthy, provided I trust that you not to overuse the word, trust that you did your vetting accurately, then I can just take on full faith that what you're doing is good and that I can do it too. <clears throat> and then I say education. Why, why that? Right. So I was a professor for a little while and I helped with uh, admissions committees. And there's always this concern of like, does an A from one school mean the same as an A from another school? Does the curriculum of one state translate to the curriculum of another state? How do I know what the student I'm about to let into my university actually knows what I think they should know or, or, what, or, what, or what I want them to know? This is also a problem that we have in the VA because we recruit a ton of people from the DOD, but we don't really have necessarily good insights into how DOD training works, how the DOD curriculum is established. And then it not only hurts us because we have a, um, an unknown entity problem being created, but it also hurts the individual on the other end because they don't have an easy way to display to us what they know or what they learned. And then they often have to do retraining. And that can be a waste of time, their time, government time, their money, government money. One instance that stands out to mind is I used to work with a naval aviator uh, and she had to take the same statistics class six different times during her career because she had to take as an undergraduate and then in nursing school. And then when she got to the Navy, and then when she became an aviator, and then when she left the Navy again, all because there was no way to drag any sort of established reliance on what when she learned it in place A, that it met the curricular understanding or, or, or the robustness of what is needed in place B. I think we can do a lot, and I'm trying to do a lot in, in the work that I'm doing to get to some sort of shared system or shared standard that can allow one agency and another agency to be able to have a quick understanding of when I say I was an AI acquisition expert at the VA, and I'm trying to get a job as an AI acquisition expert and say energy, what that means. What specifically did I learn in the VA? How does that translate specifically to what energy needs? Are there any gaps? How can we fill those gaps quickly? And in my case, how we're going to do that is a system that I'm building and working with other agencies to build called Aspire that some of you have heard me talk about before, where the whole point of the Aspire system is to use automated tools to do gap analysis and to use some of the power of data and AI to get those standards and crosswalks among curricular obligations among training obligations. So when personnel moves because they wanted a promotion or moves because they retired from the DOD, or we need them to move to respond to an emergency or a new emerging technology or a shortfall that is discovered in some readiness in some part of the government, we can do so again quickly and cleanly, right? But the only way we can do that quickly and cleanly to move our people or quickly and cleanly to move our technologies, again, if we do it together so that we can have understandings of our basis and have crosswalks among those things that we're doing and among those people that we have. Thank you. All right. Uh, I have one quick follow-up for Tony, and then we'll get to audience questions. Um, and we've got one. Sandy, hold on. Uh, I'm going to walk towards Sandy, but Tony, policy is... Walk away from Sandy. Walk towards Sandy. Uh, sometimes it's difficult. Policy can be difficult because, of course, it takes time. It takes people to come together. In the meantime, all these things are happening around you. So it's the old changing the tire while you're moving the car, or fixing the wing while you're flying. How VA started to kind of address the balance of developing policy while we need to use the policy at the same time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I suppose um, you never actually start from zero anymore, right? AI policy, new, yes. AI policy, what's it also use? Uses some IT policy, uses some data policy, uses privacy concerns, uses law that address the things that the AI does, uses, or will do. So while we do need to update them and customize them for the AI application, which is different, 
it operates a little bit differently. The, the risks profile is definitely way greater with AI. You're never really starting from, from zero. So it might be more like uh, some military vehicles and some uh, industrial uh, moving cars where not all of your wheels are touching the ground at the same time. So you might be running on six and then fixing two, and then those two drop and another two lift up and you're running on those six while fixing those two. And you can still move the boat along with some assurance and some guardrails in place while you're getting to, to a truly nice new polished set of snow tires for the slippery road ahead. All right, Sandy, you have a question? Absolutely. Uh, you spoke about Aspire and that sounds like a really great program across the board in government, especially when we heard Alexis speak earlier about starting further along in the race. So could you address that a bit more and how that's valuable to the different other agencies who are represented at the table with you as well as others and unpack it a little bit more for us here at Aspire and who else is involved with that, who you're working with and where it's at now. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, Sandy. That was $20 well spent. Everybody, Sandy, <laughs> my favorite shell. Um, so Aspire is, uh, right now it's a collaboration between the DOD, particularly the Air Force and the Navy, and soon the Army, uh, Army Special Forces specifically. Uh, the VA, NASA, it's the back, uh, HHS, and Labor. The idea is a system that, uh, how it works generally is you start with an automated assessment. The automated assessment does a gap analysis from what you know to what you're supposed to know for your rate, role, and agency. Not just am I a beginner, mediator, expert, but very specifically if I should know A, B, C, D, E, I only know A, B, C, D. Right. It is also that test is perfectly blind to you. It knows nothing about you other than you can successfully interact with the computer, which we are doing to try to remove, try to combat a lot of the inequities and biases that can come into more subjective hiring and also to counteract some of the biases that allow certain people to have had the shiny degree or the shiny internship or allow some people to maybe have gotten a PhD at Princeton 20 years ago and not read a paper since. Right. So we try to level all that out. The test is taken automatically. Then it automatically populates an individualized learning pathway just for you. So that we're not wasting your time or government dollars making you train or retrain more times and things that you don't need, like D, the naval aviator that I mentioned before, doesn't have to suffer through statistics for a seventh time. Uh, and then we validate that learning at the end to make sure you actually learn what you're supposed to learn, and then we can give you some badging. And then the idea is then any agency that uses Aspire hack, use it, knows that it's using the same secure system that's teaching and assessing in the same way. And then to go back to the alphabet thing, if the VA says for your job you need A through E, and then I transfer to energy and energy says, actually, we don't care about C, but we want you to have F. Then if both are using the Aspire system, all I have to do in my new job is train on F, validate F, and then I'm ready to rock. And energy knows that what I learned through Aspire at VA is exactly how I would have learned it at energy. It's the content that I would have gotten at energy. It's the level of validation and rigor I would have gotten at energy. And that allows us to, again, move people around and develop people much more quickly, taking them from where they are specifically where they need, they need to go, patching specific gaps very narrowly, and uh, doing so in a rigorous, robust way that uses AI, but is also secure and interesting in, in those sorts of ways. Let me open this question up to the panel too, because I think what Tony's bringing up is the education side. And Simon, you mentioned data literacy. Uh, it's it's an education. Is there something you're doing to, the consistency within one agency is one thing, but how do you spread that consistency like Aspire does? Um, well, it... I'll turn to you. Um... Yeah. So, uh, yes, education is very important, and I definitely love the work that Tony has been doing, and I try to connect him with, the, you know, also ask about how he's been doing. Uh, it's definitely helpful. Even in my agency, you know, we do not have any such implementation, but, you know, in addition to the educational programs that we have, I also encourage cr cross-platform training, shadowing, mentorship, and things like that. That help me a lot. Because a lot of times we have expertise in-house, either they have never been given the opportunity or they have been lying dormant, you know, to get that uh, option to be there. So I have encouraged a lot of uh, uh, cross-platform trainings and uh, that has helped me a lot. Omar, Tammy. Uh, in terms of education, very important. Uh, we educate them about AI. But you cannot educate everybody about the algorithms that AI uses, because then you, you lose half of your staff. Uh, but for me, in terms of the lab, we educate ourselves first, and then we ask questions, and we want our partners, the folks that deal with, with us, to answer our questions. And then we position ourselves to answer que questions of our leadership. So for me, that's the three-step process, but it always starts with education, you know, and uh, we make good investments in terms of education. We conduct brown bags. We conduct uh, training like, you know, blockchain 101, AI 101. 
we are doing this type of education because that's, you know, she mentioned it's very important to, to start right there. That's the point of start for us. So I wasn't familiar with the program until Tony talked about it. So now you piqued my interest. It's always good to get a, a bit of uh, new information. The, the thing that I would add to this, because um, it's really exciting um, to hear this because I started my career on um, active duty in the US Air Force. And it's nice to hear about these types of things because even the services in the past didn't have uh, programs like this where you would take something that you learned in the army and be able to get credit for it in the Navy or something of that nature. But what I would add to this is once you get past that, what I'll call education piece, I think what I would emphasize is at some point you need areas or safe spaces whether you call it a sandbox at the Fed, we call it the launch pad, where you can do experimentation. And that experimentation is how do you take the things that people have learned and put them in a business context to determine whether or not they can provide value. And so while I really love the idea of normalizing education across agencies and the government, because God knows we don't have the time or the dollars to retrain people. Um, I think the other thing that we have to think about is how do we make sure that we can um, create those safe spaces for responsible innovation and experimentation. All right, got another question. My question is for Omar. Um, hello, my name is Christian Walton. I'm a cyber doctoral student and ML engineer. And my question for you, Omar, is could you speak more to your counterparty risk assessment use case and also your cyber use case? Uh, for counterparty risk, we have, uh, uh, we deal with the issuers. We don't deal directly with the citizen in terms of their housing need. So the issuers are uh, folk, uh, are mortgage companies, banks, financial institutions that uh, uh, will, will pull all the mortgages into something called pool. So those are in, uh, investment instruments we sell to the investors in Wall Street or international investors. So the counterparty risk assessment is assessing the health of the portfolio of that issuer. And if you go to Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, sometimes they call them lenders. But for us, that's the name we coin issuer. So for, for the institution to be, it needs to be healthy in terms of, of their financials in terms of their, in, the insurance they have and how they manage the portfolio. Like, you know, how they are managing the liquidation, how man, managing the bankruptcy, how they're managing the, the service uh, servicing of that portfolio. So there is a lot of things that uh, we need to have oversight because that's the risk that Ginny May has. Meaning if, the, if a mortgage, if a borrower default on a, on a mortgage, because again, it's the, the full faith of the government that, uh, that guarantee, that commitment that gets to, to the issuer. So if the borrower default, it's FHA that deals with that and, and the, the, the issuer dealing with the FHA. If the issuer default, like it goes belly up, it's on Jenny May to make sure that the issuer, I mean, the investor never have any disruption getting the fund. The government guarantees that investment for them. So for us, we have a big team out there at Jenny May. They are in the portfolio uh, management and they manage those issuers. They conduct site visit, they conduct periodic checking of their uh, reporting. And I am working with them in terms of creating intelligent automation to assist them because there is a lot of burden on them in terms of what they need to do. If you saw those soldiers that uh, the first speaker mentioned, I don't want to take a picture of those account exec doing their work, looking at the documentation and managing that risk. So any help we can lend to them, it's a welcoming thing. Hope that answers your question. All right, I am getting the hook and Frank's got another panel. So let's give our panelists a big round of applause. Nice job, everybody. And um, we will exit stage left. Quickly, quickly. Tom, give me the hook. You're... 
take a chance to walk over to main grounds. If you haven't been there before, UVA is a world heritage site over there where the rotunda is and the lawn is, is quite pretty and it's interesting colonial architecture and there's gardens and things behind it. So I just encourage you to take a little time to walk over there if you get a chance before you leave town. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, in the meantime, thank you all very much. You can leave the microphones. And Frank, you want to get your next panel going? And 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 guess what? What I have? Yeah, yeah. I know you're all excited like I am. So this one is a reskilling AI workforce panel. So I have a workforce uh, trivia question. Uh, and here here we go. Pay attention, everyone. We all know uh, DHS is uh, all agencies are trying to hire people with uh, AI skill sets. We just heard about this today. Homeland Security Department recently announced something called the AI Core. Uh, give me a guess. How many applications did DHS receive since February when they put out the call for applicants? I need a number. How many applicants did they receive for resumes? Three, too little. Two, two, still too little. A million, too many. You guys are all over the place. Go ahead. 2,000. Uh, very close. According to uh, the Secretary of Homeland Security told House lawmakers last week, they got more than 3,000 applicants for 50 experts to hire. So it's a hot topic. A lot of people want to go. And Frank, you're going to tell us why it's it's so uh, so exciting. Yeah, I have that. Just making sure we all get up here without any injuries. All right. And we also, do we have a, a panelist who is uh, joining virtually as well? If we do, maybe he'll appear on the, the screen. I think we had planned one, but someone's got to work that out on the back end. Okay, uh, so this panel is all about AI reskilling, and uh, we do. I think the last panel before lunchtime. So let's just uh, let's get right into it and not take three hours. Um, should we do introductions briefly, or should we just get some questions? Actually, I'm going to ask the first question. We'll start on my immediate left, and then we'll just um, before you take it, introduce yourselves and your roles, and then we'll go from there. So since this is on AI reskilling. The obvious question, what are we doing to reskill our folks to get ready for this next generation of technology? Hello. My name is Jamie Holcomb. I'm the CIO at the USPTO. You've probably heard this before. PTO stands for paid time off. Not exactly. It's patent and trademark office. And what we've done is actually made it um, attractive to become an AI expert. Now, how do we do that? Uh, we sent uh, people to get googly. The hell does that mean? I took 12 top engineers, six went to the West Coast, six went to the East Coast, and they got certified in TensorFlow over four years ago. That has actually seeded the interest that I can do this stuff and you don't have to, and now generative AI, oh, I wanna do this, I wanna do that, I wanna get trained. So you create the and inspire people to get retrained because in my opinion, the federal workforce has so much latent capacity. It just takes the challenge of leadership to tell them, go get trained. Nice, love it. Hi, uh, I'm Tony Holmes and I work for Pluralsight and we help with, uh, we help organizations and agencies with preparing for the onslaught of AI that's uh, rapidly coming towards us. We help advise people on how they can make the best of opportunities and give them advice and best practice that we've learned along the way to help them understand how other people are approaching the problem. I don't know if Tammy's still in here. New fan for you, Tammy. Um, very much enjoyed the, the things that you said that you're doing at FRB. Um, and it's very similar to the kind of things that we help our clients do in, in terms of embracing the technology, helping uh, upskill and reskill the workforce, and helping people find talent where they didn't expect to find talent and bring them to bear on the new technology. Thank you. Tony, what about, well, let's stay there for a second. What, about, what are you doing inside your, your company, though, to reskill your own folks to make sure that they're up to date with everything that's coming out? Yeah, that's a great question. So we, we very much, to, to use a, a cliche we very much eat our own dog food we have um, a lot of ai built into our platform that helps people understand where skill gaps are which means we can actually shorten the time to skills by making sure that people only learn the knowledge that they don't have rather than covering a whole bunch of stuff that they probably already carry with them so essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to use an agile methodology combined with ai to keep understanding where their skill gaps are at and then to keep addressing those skill gaps got it 
your remark about dog food reminds me the lunch is coming. <laughs> I, I hear analogy a lot, but I always wonder why don't people just say breakfast? I like say that. <laughs> Eat my own breakfast. Eat my own dog food. It doesn't seem very tasty. No, it doesn't. Edward. Thanks. My name is Ed McClarney. I'm about five years into my journey as AI and machine learning transformation lead as a part of our overall transformation. Um, we'll be establishing a chief AI officer soon. I'm about eight days into my journey of being one of the core staff for that chief, chief AI officer. So one of the things, one of the thing, eight days, eight days a week. Um, one of the things I'm thinking about is not only how we educate our workforce, but how we educate our leaders. So how do you lead those of us who are working AI? What are the questions that you need to ask us? Everybody knows people pay, pays, pay attention to the things that the boss asks. So what do our bosses need to ask? Also, our, our bosses are going to be the ones who invest in AI. So how do we um, enable them to make good investment decisions and that, that help them move us ahead? That's enough for now. I'll pass along. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen Howard. I'm the director of the Office of Online Services with the Internal Revenue Services, uh, affectionately IRS. For those of you who aren't aware, today is April 15th, tax day. So Surprise. if I see anyone running out of here real quick, we'll know why. <laughs> so how are we reskilling our workforce? So uh, for me, we are taking a very methodical approach. Um, so not really looking at everyone has to know AI and be upskilled, because I think that's unrealistic, especially with the newness. I think the gentleman next to me mentioned a skill gap analysis. And that's what we're doing. We're really crosswalking those basic core competencies that will make someone successful and looking at those employees first. Then, of course, looking at the position descriptions um, and, and making those changes so that we can elevate, begin to target the employees who have those baseline core competencies who can be successful first. So I think really taking that very methodical approach um, with the skill crosswalk, recognizing the skill gap, and then targeting um, the upskilling efforts around A, those employees who have the core competencies, and B, those areas when we when we look to leverage AI in a um, uh, making the agency more effective, those areas that have a lot of manual processes, and and so so taking that prioritization approach. Good afternoon, Eric Sanders. I'm with the Office of Intelligence and Analysis at Department of Homeland Security. We're doing a lot of uh, uh, same things that uh, my partners to my right expressed. We did invest in a learning platform over the last year or so and categorized our employees um, within the uh, division that I'm part of and categorized our employees based on uh, you know whether they're in data, whether they're cybersecurity, um, and uh, IT ops and a couple other categories, and then you know built out uh, learning tracks for them, and do things like skill assessments to try to identify what gaps do our folks have. It's a great tool for our supervisors and managers across uh, TDS where I am, uh, so that they can assess where their folks are, where their folks need to be, and then kind of what training do they need to have to get them there. So. Uh, you know, it's important for me, like as, you know, uh, cybersecurity uh, professional, it's important for me to understand how AI is going to be used and to be part of that uh, conversation before it gets used uh, to make sure that we do have the kinds of guardrails in place that we should have in place before we start leveraging new technologies like that. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so I want to go to the paid time left department over here on my left and just, um, just ask, I've heard you say something along the lines of, you, you can't run a 2024 organization with a 1960s playbook. And I, that resonated with me a little bit. I want you to expand on that. How are you making sure that USPTO doesn't do that? And can they do that? So the way I look at things, and again, I'll just emphasize the fact of how can you actually think of running a 2025 organization using a 1960 playbook from OPM? Right. It's ludicrous, is it not? And yet that's what we're doing. So we have a whole corporate structure where we have said, OK, the hierarchy is what it's modeled after the corporate man, which is modeled after 
the great success we had in World War II using military organization. Okay, I'm a West Point guy, U.S. Army. <laughs> Come on, right? It does work in certain situations. But if anything, the past 40 years have taught us is it don't work no more. And so for us to think that we're going to try entry level and recruiting for college graduates to come into federal service or into DHS or into others, it's a fallacy. We have to change the way we think. People don't stay around for careers anymore. They don't. Now, that might be a good thing for the federal government, right? But how many people are we talking about? Such a small percentage of people are looking for pension. They're looking for challenge. And that's why the military and law enforcement and drug enforcement, that's why they're getting the young folks. The federal civilian sector is not getting young folks. Why would you go and work in a bureaucracy where you have to do all this compliance and all these, oh my God, I can't use my phone? Yeah, because it's terrible, right? So I don't understand what we're doing because what we need to do is actually do what the corporate world has done, which works. And that is have programs for entry level, have programs for mid-level, and have programs for senior level. And in each of those cases, I've got a good idea. What is the one thing that people come to the federal government for? Well, it should be challenge and patriotism, right? Appeal to them to say, look, you can help out your nation by doing this. But you also have to have what's in it for me. I mean, come on, right? So what you do is you give them, if they have five years of service, at the end of their career, they can have health care. Think about that. That's one of the biggest costs any retiree has. Why don't we do that for five years of service at the entry level, at the mid-level, and at the senior level? Oh, by the way, maybe it shouldn't be just a one and done. Maybe we should encourage people to have five years entry, five years middle, and five years senior by going out into the commercial marketplace and bringing back good ideas. Why do we want somebody who's been in the federal government the whole time? Well, that's the way we do it. Well, why? Why don't you do things differently? So I hope I've provided enough inspiration to think differently. I mean, yeah, I love it. I just want to make the rest of the panel riffing off that. and. Damon didn't even have his coffee this morning, actually. <laughs> oh, we do. Oh. Rajiv, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, oh, the algorithms worked. We're good. Amazing. Rajiv, you probably just heard what was just uh, spoken by Jamie Holcomb at the uh, USPTO. I I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on that. And we're all staring at your beautiful headshot here in this big hotel ballroom. Yeah, I see, can't seem to turn on my video for some odd reason. So the algorithm is not working there. But it's a tough act to follow when, ja you know, tough act to follow Jamie. Um, my name is Raj Dulles, everyone. I am the Chief Technology Officer for National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, Bureau within Department of Transportation. Um, our journey began, well, AI journey began about a little over a year ago. We started... Um, with a, a working group, formation of a working group to, to, to create an enterprise data strategy. We realized that in order to truly um, execute successfully on any AI, we need to make sure that our data is available, data is clean, data is not hidden. And um, that working group is led, the two co-chairs of that working group are my chief data officer, and my chief enterprise architect. Fortunately for us, both of them are very well experienced in AI, ML, and data strategy. They both are data scientists. And what that led, led to us, led, led to us to do is to ensure that we're engaging all data practitioners of the agency, understanding where the workforce limitations are today from training perspective and setting a, a very robust training plan for folks who are on board, who are you know coders or who are solution architects, who are testers or cloud engineers, and, and setting up a, 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 a well-designed curriculum for them, driven by them to, to make sure that we're going to the place where we want to go. Obviously, when it comes to you know one-on-one type of courses, we're not interested in sending folks to training 
uh, which costs a lot of money. And us being government agencies, money is always in short supply for us. But when it comes to specific areas where po folks want to get better and want, we need that skill set, uh, that is where the individual uh, development uh, opportunities are being leveraged. And it's working out so far, it's working out really well. We, we have two proofs of concept that we completed uh, just recently, and we're trying to, con not trying to, we will be converting them into enterprise-wide services. Where we want to go is basically set up a very robust plat, a very good and a robust platform for the entire agency uh, and run parallel streams of proofs of concept that turn into development, that turn into services for the entire, entire organization. And education wise, not only do the folks, you know, geeks like us would love to code and roll our sleeves up, um, have our opportunity to train, but also folks who are in different spectrums of AI ML. There are various, um, if, you, if you take intelligent automation as an umbrella, there are lots of different things in there. There's RPA, there is NLP, AI and ML and so on and so forth. So we're looking at multiple opportunities, start, starting from text parsing to image analysis to video analysis. And all of these have lots of opportunities for our workforce. Thanks, Rajiv. I'm glad you could join us. All right, let's, let's riff off what Jamie had said here for our live panelists. I mean, talk to me about what we, what we need to do to get to a place like that, where our branding is better, where we're more attractive to young people, where we're actually out in universities trying to entice these folks. Edward, you might have an interesting case because NASA's always, they do pretty well in getting young people in. I mean, it's because it's of the notoriety perhaps, everyone knows NASA, the space missions are very obvious, um, but what can we do better to get to a place like where, where Jim would love to have us? I per check one, two. I, I personally think we need to be faster. We need to be a lot faster. One of the things we need to learn, and it's not an AI thing, but it's an AI enabling thing, is how to work our processes to onboard emerging technologies faster. How to, somebody mentioned procurement earlier. How to not just be stuck with your normal old procurement processes, but use the most creative procurement processes to be really responsive. Um, to me, I see cloud as an axis of innovation. So for me, if we're going to do AI innovation, we need to learn how to be bosses at cloud. So uh, all of those things, though, are to be more, are to be faster and more responsive in providing our, our folks the capabilities that we need. And we need to do, be faster in our education, too. So Tony mentioned the, the Spire capability that the VA is building. I'm highly interested in that as that comes along, been able to, to participate in testing there. Great to see the, the interagency cooperation there. In the meantime, though, we're, we're going through our existing learning platform, trying to find the wheat from the chaff to recommend to people so they don't have to, to go do it themselves. So I spent a day recently looking through all kinds of our, our um, learning plat platforms content, looking for 15 minutes that we could set the hook in our senior leader. And so take not only pursuing um, collaborative education models, but using what you got, use the, use the 10 bucks that's in your pocket already and be faster, whether it's education or technology providing. Karen, how are you getting people come to the IRS when they're young? How are you doing that? Yeah, well, one of the things- It was my dream to, as a child, by the way, to work at the IRS. We have two, I would say two, two hills to climb here. Not only the, the modernization and the technology advancement, but the IRS is just iconically hated. Their parents are telling them, run, you don't want to work for them. So we have to get over that hump first. And when we go out to recruit, we have to go out understanding that it's not for everyone and to identify those people who not only have a passion for um, working and giving back to civil service, but also um, have a passion for change. And when we talk about what the agency needs to do first to recruit, we need to modernize everything. We talk about digital transformation, leveraging AI, but then digital to transform something we want to do that but we don't want to change and i think it goes back to what what you were saying so the first thing we have to do is really be transparent about our struggle 
right? So people know that there, I came from the private sector three years ago in the middle of the pandemic, and that was hard. Um, what I thought I knew was worse than it was. When, when you talked about culture and change, I came from a very fast paced, digitally transforming um, uh, organizations. And it's like putting a sprinter in a marathon. Um, but when you get people who are, who, who, who can leverage their ability to drive change with their interpersonal skills to navigate that, those are the type of core competencies that we have to look for. People who are, you know, maybe I don't like, I didn't like the IRS. I was probably one of its, <laughs> but when you talk about people who want to come in and instead of being talking about the problem, being part of the solution, and that was my driver. So that's what we focus on first. And then we, we talk about um, how we're funded now. So in recruiting now, we, we're funded, well-funded to modernize the agency, and we need talent to be able to do that. Um, in, in fast, we've got funding that, you know, 10 years of funding, which is now down to eight and 20 billion less. And so if we're not spending this money and rapidly changing and proving, showing the American public and the Hill, you know, it's that where's the beef moment for the, some of you that grew up in, in the Wendy's, when Wendy's first hit the street, we have to show that. So we're ready to move fast but we can't move fast with people who don't know how to move fast. So we have to in, bring in new sprinters to accelerate the pace of marathoners to a comfort level, but also sprinters also have to calibrate their speed. And so I think being really transparent about that, talking about the funding, really touting the um, strategic operating plan that backs the Inflation Reduction Act and the modernization of technology um, really helps us to attract the right people for the agency. Karen, you might, I just stick with you for one second, and we'll go to we'll go to Eric. But so, first off, I know you must like challenges because coming to an agency like IRS from the private sector, I mean, a lightning rod like that. I, I think I pulled, got bamboozled. Then, then it gets they pulled. They bamboozled in. me. <laughs> but uh, so, let's say you 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 are recruiting, but I mean, is there in-house training for existing folks who've been yes. there? Folks, they would absolutely. There you know, there's this fear that bringing in new people that you know we're going to put everybody out there. You need both. You need people who are going to think differently. I like to say, if everybody in the room is thinking the same, no one's really thinking. So you need people who are going to challenge the status quo, but also people who are going to help new people understand legacy and history and what's been done and why it's important and really understand the culture. And while you don't want to be a bull in a china shop, you do want to kind of move people along at a pace that's comfortable with the win-win, the what is, what's in it for me and how can we be better. And the large demand is really going to come from the American public really being tired of um, the service levels and the experience with the agency. I was on TikTok. Yes, I watch TikTok. And I saw what was happening in some of the tax centers um, yesterday, which was disturbing because it really took me back to when I was a child and, and, and me and my mom used to get up to go to the DMV and pack a lunch and you're there all day and a snack. And then I look on, this is 2024 and we have lines wrapped out. You know, that's not a good come work for us statement, right? So how do we look at those things and get out in front of it and say, how can we be better? Well, just watching and looking at the experience that we I came up with probably 20 things we can go back and automate leveraging digital services and online account and some of the things that we have in the backlog. And it just, what what happened um, kind of underscored the need to move even quicker. I can't wait till y'all hire a TikTok person for IRS. Like I was- I Gotta I, know I what the account. people are doing. Eric, besides getting DHS on TikTok, what are you gonna, what are you doing over there? <laughs> I'd rather stick with the previous topic. I'd <laughs> I bet you would. TikTok a little bit. But, um, you know, as the, so I don't know how familiar people are with INA, the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, but we're one of the IC elements, intelligence community elements. So uh, a lot of our folks, you know, have to work in skips. So there's a challenge there. You're trying to get young folks to, you know, sign up. Um, they really got to have a passion for public service and wanting to uh, contribute to the defense of the home, right? Tell them, give up all your technology when you show up for work every day. 
Um, you know, there's been some changes in that. I've been in, in the IC for a, a long time. So I've seen a lot of changes, everything from don't you dare take it out of your car to at least now you can kind of sit in the lobby, you know, and check in with folks online. So it's gotten a little better there, but it's still a challenge. And I think it's one that kind of scares away uh, a lot of potential recruits. But at the same time, once they get in, when we move slowly, when, when we frustrate them because we can't enable them the way they are expect to be enabled, then we tend to see some turnover, um, especially with like developers and, and if they're not equipping them with the right tools, uh, then, you know, they're going to get frustrated. With it. And so that's another challenge. But so we want to enable all these new technologies as quickly as we can. But in order to do that, we got to build the guardrails around them first. So we, have, so we have to be quick about that. We can't sit back and, and lament new technologies. You know, most I see agencies when, you know, uh, Gen AI, you know, uh, came boring into our lives not too long ago, the first reaction was no, right? Just absolutely no, block, block, block. Um, and, you know, was that the right thing to do or not? Um, you know, at DHS, we came out pretty quickly with guardrails and said, you can use it in this way if you meet these requirements, if you do these things first, um, and you don't use it on particular data sets, right? We have to be very cautious about how we go about using AI and Gen AI in particular uh, when it's a, you know, a public offer, right? Uh, we can't take non-public data and put it into, you know, a tool that's going to be available to the general public. So we have to be very careful about uh, what data we use where and then what technologies we need to bring in-house so that we can empower our folks that are on the inside that are doing work at different levels uh, to use those same tools or tools similar to them as quickly as possible. Otherwise, they're going to leave us. And they're going to go to other places where they can do these things and be more successful, uh, be more. Uh, I, I agree. They're not going to. They're not necessarily sticking around for twenty years. But what do you do for the folks that have been and plan to? Um, you know. So I talked earlier about a learning platform, but making sure that. You know, it's not just lip service that we're committing to education. You know, we put an hour on the calendar every week um, where people, you know, join that meeting, right? But they're not actually having a meeting. We're just kind of all saying, hey, we're here and we're here to do learn today for this next hour. And so, you know, whatever that skill gap is for that person, um, you know, I show up as often as I can to make sure that my team knows I'm committed to continually learning. Um, and that, you know, I'm committed to them doing it as well. So uh, I think, you know, kind of making sure that we're setting that example that I myself don't become that 20 year employee who's, you know, change resistant. And then, you know, finally, I think it's, it's also important to assess your leadership team and understand who your change agents are, right? Who are the folks that, that embrace change and want to push change? Um, you know, and put them in the positions that they should be in in order to, you know, affect change at, uh, you know, not just faster, but more effectively, right? So um, if we just throw change out there too quickly uh, and we don't address all the things that make that change acceptable to the people that need to use it, then they're just going to project it anyway. So um, a lot of work to do there, I think, um, to make change effective, but, you know, it all starts with our people, make sure that the right people the right yeah, I like that advice. I mean, find your change agents, agents and let them be the, the evangelists for your organization. Rajiv, if you're there with us, please weigh in on this one really quick, and then I'm going to turn it over to some audience uh, for Q&A. Sure. Um, so inherently, hiring in government is slower than hiring in private sector. There's no question about that. We do need to improve and in, improve the agility at which we can hire. The second aspect is bring in younger, fresh college graduates or folks with you know, a few years of experience into government. Um, the competition with private sector is tremendous, especially in the areas of AI and ML. So we cannot compete on a financial package. We have to compete on their, the call to the service, public service. Uh, my, my agency's mission is to save lives and that appeals to quite a number of people. And, and we have we've been surprised, pleasantly surprised, that there are folks, uh, younger generation folks, who are willing to join our organization. What we are trying to do, and we have been we have been working at it for about a year plus now, is removing 
as many silos as we can within the organization, letting folks interact with each other, ensuring that there is cross-training, there's cross-pollination of ideas, and folks are learning from each other. The train the trainer model works really well. When you have a peer teaching you how to do a few things that the, the younger folks may or the less experienced folks may not have. The, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, individual development plans that are focused and driven by employees themselves, uh, ensuring that they, they're learning things that they want to learn, but they're still focused on where the mission of the agency is. Uh, you know, we want to develop IT that is focused on delivering and uh, strategic um, solutions for the agency to meet the strategic goals. Just because you have you want to learn something that is not associated with what where we want to go, doesn't mean we will prohibit you. But we want you to be focused more on technologies that we want to use. And and then the last thing I'll say in that is. Um, introductory courses, um, you know, are nice. And that's where the train the trainers can really step in and build that camaraderie that's necessary. And we've seen a lot of success in that. But at the same time, we want to encourage and push a little bit sometimes the employees towards uh, getting training that is absolutely necessary and, you know, advanced courses, if you will. Um, that's where having a dedicated training budget, ensuring that you are Asking when, when the employees go on a train, a training um, uh, for, for some training somewhere, you're not asking them to do uh, additional work. A lot of people feel forced that as they're going on a training, they still got to catch. Brigitte, we might have lost you. But thank you for your thoughts. I actually think you made a great point about the call to service. I was looking at some some data before this panel about. Gen Z and what they, you know, what calls them to to jobs and employment, and a call to service, a mission oriented mission was really really high on the list. I think it was actually the top criteria that they looked for. So perhaps there is an opportunity there, if we can get better, as Jamie said, at some of these archaic rules that are fixing USA Jobs would be a great start for making that a little bit easier. Um, just my opinion. Let's get some questions from the audience here. We got a few minutes. Young woman in the front here. All right, Sandy, you got the first one. Don't touch the mic. <laughs> Hi, Sandy Mastery. So a uh, question in terms of with recruitment since after the pandemic, we've all gone remote. I know, Jamie, for you, it's a little different. You've always been remote, your office. Have you been able to attract more talent with the remote being part of the qualifier? Oh. Yeah, so one of the things that we noticed was, you know, when I started head of that office, we traditionally ran 60, 50 to 60 percent to our what we were what we call our ASP, right? What who we can hire, right? Always understaffed. When we begin to look and modernize our working models, our, you know, offering more flexible working models, we rapidly were able to attract um, because I think people get caught up on financial, but there's a bigger driver out there for people, flexibility, quality of life, time with friends. So we and family, we were able to really ramp up and get to 90% of our ASP in a short time because the agency, we did a, a, a re totally remote pilot. Can't be done in every office, but certainly could be done in mine. Then of course, couple of months ago, what happened? The mandate for 50-50 return to office, and we rapidly saw a slowdown in the amount of people applying. So I, when, I, when I say that if we want to attract and look at more modern ways of working, um, you know, let's be purposeful about and considerate about socioeconomic factors, right? It's very expensive now for childcare, for healthcare, Another thing that 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 we saw was um, in the private sector, and this is what we use a lot, there's instability, right? One day you're working a good job, they hire you, they get the, the P&L or the quarterly return, and then all of a sudden there's massive layoff. That's another thing. So when we had remote work, purposeful in office, right, intentional, 
what that requires when you talk about um, a more stable environment, right? We very rarely do you do massive layoffs in the federal government. You have places to go, you can move around, and you don't. You starting to see more and more in the private sector these massive layoffs. Um, we were able to attract Google talent. I mean, some of the best talent out there, and it really, really showed in our ability to deliver on our um, on our mission for the Inflation Reduction Act. And now we've seen a slowdown, so we're really leaning into uh, state stability, more stable um, um, uh, career and career growth. So remote work helps, but what you know, this new mandate to bring everybody back shows that we don't want to learn how to manage differently. We should manage to outcomes and key results. Just because I can see you doesn't mean you're producing. Um, and so if we really, most of the time people in office aren't, you know, if you really, really track them, they're hanging out, talking to folks, you know, they're on their phone. So it should really be based on outcomes. And when we start doing that, allowing more balance in where people and how they can work, relaxing some of these very stringent 1960s models of I got to see you to know that you're doing work and be more purposeful about bringing people in and manage differently, managing the outcomes, we will see people returning. Um, and, and so that really, you know, we were on a roll and then all of a sudden, the, I mean, it was like a drastic drop off. Like we had offers out there, people pulled back on and it was shocking. The rationale there, we still don't really understand, but we're trying to find ways to work around it because it's effective um, the first week of May. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Outcome oriented. It all depends upon your mission. And so, exactly. And we have to change the way we lead. Just to assume that people are going to accept the hierarchy any longer is a fallacy. Most of our younger generation does not accept the hierarchy. You go to the military, okay. You go to law enforcement, okay. Maybe the fire department. But other than that, the hierarchy does not exist in young people's minds. Okay, we have a huge, robust program that was started in 2012. Before I ever got there, examiners are remote and hybrid all over America. Now, we can't have them in foreign lands, of course, because the data protection is not the same. All right. But as long as you're in America, you can work at the PTO. That was a strong pull. Now, when COVID came, all of a sudden, the support personnel, we can also offer that to them because we showed how you can remotely work. All right, great, mission-oriented, right? We're very thoughtful in what we do. We examine. Well, how about the support people? They don't need to be there as long as all the infrastructure is set. And moving to the cloud is a great thing because it's all about the cloud. It's all virtual. Fantastic. I think Elon Musk, when he said it's all about the work, you can't have management of manufacturing plants. Call it in. Why? They're not on the floor. They don't see what's going on. There are people there besides robots. There are people there doing work. You can't lead from behind. You can't lead virtual unless your workforce is virtual. So that's another thing about leadership. You have to attach the right tool to the right thing at the right time, right? People, process, and tools. And I think every <laughs> hardest thing to change is people, but they're the best asset you have. The next hardest thing to change is your tools because it takes a huge investment. But the easiest thing to change and the thing we don't change enough is process. You could wipe away everything by signing something. Get it gone. Don't do it anymore. It's stupid. No, that's the way we've done things. We have to do it this way. If you really look at all the compliance measures, there are so many rules and regulations that contradict one another. So how are you supposed to manage? Congress says this, the president says this, how am I supposed to do that? What am I gonna do? Lead, state it, be transparent, be collaborative, make sure you go talk to your general counsel, but you're not gonna go to jail. But other than that, <laughs> make the right choice for the mission. I'm not trying to go work for the PTO. Let's, let's Frank, get it. Frank, we have a question back here. Yes, one one tell, last tell question, me are. I think, perhaps. Hi, I'm Patrick Sisk, Senior Contracting Officer. So we are out there. We're not all bad. So um, so I hear the common refrain on a lot of niche fields like AI, talent, um, the government cannot compete with the private sector. 
Um, but we have to, obviously, because we need this talent unless we're hiring contractors. What are some hiring flexibilities and incentive based tactics that you've used you've used that have been successful thus far? So we were, we were granted a direct hire authority, direct hire authority, which allows us to accelerate to hire on the spot. Obviously, then they have to go through some of the vetting. But in key, highly competitive roles like data scientists, data architects, taxonomists, we were able to um, work with um, HCL, which took a long time because of OPM roles, but we were able to get direct hiring authority for roles that are highly competitive out there. We also leveraged, um, we expanded our core our core POD, which is post of duty. So the, for the Office of Online Services, most of our people used to work in the DMV area. We're not going to get these kids out of school living in the third, what is DC, the third highest place to live in the, in the U.S. And so being able to hire in any city, what we call, you know, stay, we're expanding our PODs, post of duties from six to 39 we were able to accelerate that hiring and allowing people to work remote and come in purposeful interaction with tactics that we use. Again, we also really leaned on stability. I mean, at the time when all of these majors, the Googles, you know, and, 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 and um, Amazons are laying off, people feel that burn. We can run in right there. Oops, sorry. We can run in right there and start swooping up these people because they now know what it feels to go into work and wait for the earnings call and say, who's gonna be on the hit list. And so if we really target those things that are impacting society and you can offer something better, peace of mind is a wonderful thing. And when you can give people peace of mind that you can move around in the government from agency from agency in within the IRS, you can develop your skills ladder, um, uh, career ladder roles, and really talk to that. Um, I think it makes a difference for older generations, really talk about the stability and ability to retire with health care. So really lean on, first of all, um, cater your, what I call your marketing spiel to your audience. Younger people are going to want to hear about stability. They're sick of living in their parents' basements. They want to hear about being paid fairly and being able to live somewhere where it's affordable. Older generation that come with that expertise and that ability to lead and manage, they want, I'm getting ready to retire. I want to have health care. I want to, you know, quality time with my kids and my grandkids. So tailor your recruiting tactics to the audience you're trying to attract. Anyone else on the panel thoughts on that? Good question. I just get one, a, a totally disconnected thought for you. We're, we're thinking about federated AI governance, federated data governance, it makes me think maybe federated AI workforce development. And the idea is, I am certainly not smart enough to sit in, in my ivory tower and explicitly delineate every single checklist item that a given person in a given organization needs to learn or, or do to, to do AI. So they always tell you when you go to university, it's about learning how to think not what to think. So I think what we ought to be doing in our workforce development efforts is teaching people how to think about AI, not exactly what to think about it, and having different communities and people co-develop the training that they're going to give their organizations. They always say you learn far more about something if you have to teach it. Right? So co-develop your, your training with, with your practitioners you'll get their buy-in, they'll learn something as they're doing it, it'll be far better than if you try to dictate it from the top. Tony or Eric, any closing thoughts on that before we go to lunch? Yeah, I'll make it quick <clears throat> because uh, I'm between you and lunch and I don't wanna be that guy. Um, there's a lot of really good points been hit on here. I think um, my points would be controversial, but luckily we have Jamie here, so I, I don't feel quite so uncomfortable about it now. Um, one of the things that we're really good at is we're really good at excluding people. We're not good at including people. So one of the refrains we hear all the time is what academic institutions are you working with? Well, that's great. But if you look at the technology vacancies that are available right now, if you take every graduate on a technology track in every university across the country and graduate today, 
today they're all graduated. There isn't enough people to fill the jobs out there. So again, going back to front being, what are you trying to achieve? Okay, Con a consulting approach to it. What are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to recruit people that can do the job or are we trying to recruit people with degrees? Okay, so that's the first thing I would say on top of that is if you spread the net wider, we've already heard from people in other panels that um, talent from AI can come from the most unexpected places. We heard that from the, from the lady from the Federal Reserve Board. Why aren't we going out there and looking at underserved, underserved communities that also have really good ideas and probably have a think a, a lot differently from the traditional person? My point is there's spaces for everybody. The more the more things change, the more they stay the same. You know, we had we had mainframes, then we had virtualization. Now we've got cloud, essentially an evolution of the same thing. OK, we had um, office suites come along and everybody was all worried that we're going to make all the documentation electronic. How are we going to control that? It's all going to be scary. I think, you know, to go one step further than that, AI is coming. I think it was a I, I don't know if she said it today, but Alexis keynote um, from this morning you know, one of her terms that she uses is AI is coming, deal with it. Mm. I think, you know, from, from that perspective, we need to kind of encourage people to learn and to experience and to grow. And that comes with something like broad-based training and exposing it, again, going back to what Tammy said earlier, exposing it to people you wouldn't normally expose technology to and seeing where the talent comes from and then cross-skilling people up from your organization. I guarantee you there are people in your organization that would love an opportunity to work in technology, but they just don't have that because they see all of these requirements. They see USA jobs with this laundry list of things you have to do, otherwise you can't apply. It's exclusionary rather than inclusionary. You're not looking for people that think differently. And just to close it off, human beings are terrible at thinking exponentially. We're really good at thinking linearly, but we're horrible at thinking exponentially. And technology is moving exponentially. So what you need is you need people that can adapt quickly. As technology changes, you need to be able to pivot, okay? Today it's AI, tomorrow it's gonna to be AI converging with who knows what else. I can't keep up with it, okay? But what you need is you need to be able to hire people that can, that can change on a dime. So you also, you need though to find adaptable people as much as you need to find people that have existing skill sets that come from colleges, come from universities and things like that. And that's all I would say about that. Yeah, that's a great close. Eric, do you have anything on that? So what? Uh... Yeah, so I'm sure many of you are as hungry as I am, so I'll be, I will be quick. Um, so, but to answer the question, you know, what are some of the things that we're doing uh, to, you know, hire and retain our folks? Um, well, first of all, I also have problems in my contractor workforce. So it's not just hiring government folks. We do have direct hire authority, so that's one of our tools. Um, but, you know, our contractor workforce, as soon as somebody gets a job that's more remote than, or more telework than ours allows, then they're gone, right? And a lot of folks are, they're willing to trade pay for telework and quality of life. And I don't blame them. Uh, I think, you know, COVID gave us all a taste of that. And said, wow, you know, this this can be done. It could be better. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, some of us have to go back to work anyway, um, whether it was effective or not. Uh, but, you know, in addition to, uh, you know, hiring authority, we are able to pay a little bit differently or better in some cases than uh, the typical government agency can. We use the larger uh, headquarters, DHS uses what they call the cyber talent management system, which has uh, much larger pay ranges and higher pay ranges than the GS scale does. So uh, if you have the right kind of talent, skills and abilities, then you, know, you can possibly make a lot more than you can as a GS employee. Uh, we also do cyber pay within INA itself. So after you've been there for a year, we can offer you a little bit more if you've got the right kind of certifications and earn the right kind of job. So, thanks. Um, well, that wraps it up. Uh, these guys, this is a thought-provoking panel. So, give them a round of applause and lightly accost them at lunch if you want more answers. <laughs> <laughs>